Recording in progress. Welcome to our, oh boy, I forgot. Oh, it's on the screen. Eighth annual um, Matrix for Humans Matrix movie nights with discussion. Um, over the last couple of years, we've now up to four movies. So that uh, changes a few things in terms of perspective. Um, and more folks coming in. Hold on. I, gotta, I need a secretary. I need to put a job posting. <laughs> Somebody. Um, okay. So welcome. Here we are. Um, so yeah, over the years, there's been a lot of uh, a lot of discussion, more than any other movie on The Matrix, uh, blogs, forums, websites. I mean, it's amazing how much is out there and still going on. Even you know, even when the between the third and fourth movies, when we had <clears throat> what seventeen or eighteen years, it just kept going. Nothing like it. And and one of the interesting things, of course, is when you look at this, everybody has a perspective on the movies because everybody sees something in it that attracts them. So if they're, if they're a particular religion or particular, or they're into philosophy, sort of like uh, Greek or even French philosophy, um, psychology, there's all, everybody's seeing parts of it, which is kind of like the story of the, the blind men and the elephant, you know, the blind men were led into a room and there was an elephant and every one of them touched a different part of the elephant. Then they all went back in to describe what an elephant is. And they all ones like describing the legs, one describing the, the trunk and the tail and, and so on. So everybody has a little piece of the puzzle, but they're all looking at it kind of, uh, I would say they're almost like you could say they're all, they're looking at it from like within, within a matrix point of view, like they're not seeing it from beyond which is the whole theme of the matrix of course so there is a single uh unified theory if we were albert einstein right the, the unified theory that they're all looking for so what we have here with these movies is really is something amazing and they are basically um what you would call a a midrash uh which is a conceptual teachings brought together and they are entirely grounded in the Torah and in, in the more the more um, mystical aspect of the Torah called Kabbalah uh, and 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 other things too, but mainly that. And um, it's really uh, amazing to see this because it's not like one or two things or even a dozen cool things. It's hundreds of things all through these movies, all exactly as they're explained in Kabbalah and connected and interconnected as they are explained in Kabbalistic teachings, including the sequence of events and the timeline and everything through the movies. It's, as you'll see, a good chunk of it tonight, what I'm talking about with some of the information I'm putting out. But um, this is kind of like hitting, the somebody hits the lottery, you go, they're lucky. But if they hit the lottery every single time they played it, you'd start to wonder there's something up, right? <laughs> so this this is like that. It's like when I started investigating this mo these movies uh, back in 2000. Three, I started with the second and third movies. So I said, my wife and I were like, something's going on here. We started looking into this going, this is crazy. And the more we looked, the more we found, which is a line from the fourth movie, by the way. The more you look, the more you find. Um, so there are a lot of uh, biblical type references that are, some are easier to, to spot more or less. Uh, you do have the whole theme of like exile, um, which is could be looked at as like Genesis, Garden of Eden, or or Israel and Egypt, and uh, I mean Israel you know, coming out of Egypt and all that. So the whole exile theme, and that's important because it's not it's only touched on a little bit in this movie. The backstory, like what happened, how did they all get in the Matrix? The back there is a whole backstory to this that they didn't put in the movies because it would have been too much. Uh, so basically, uh, human beings became uh, had a society with a uh, develop AI, believe it or not, you'll hear it in this movie, <laughs> artificial intelligence created uh, all these machines and robots and this wonderful world. And instead of being happy with the wonderful world and maintaining a good balance and doing everything right, they became very self-centered, turned the machines into slaves. The machines became intelligent, revolted. They tried to work it out, big war. Humans end up in the matrix where they're, uh, if you're not familiar, they're, they're, they think they're in the real world. You probably already know this. If not, they think people think they're in the real world, but they're not. They're actually lying in pods uh, with a program running that's uh, connected to their minds. And they, everything looks real, but they're not. It's the machines that are controlling them. Um, so, so there's a genesis theme in terms of uh, exile. Uh, then you have the redeemer theme, uh, like the book of Exodus with Moses and all that. And of course, there's redeemer themes in Christianity and, and all kinds of movies, uh, movies, religions. Um, then you also have the, the love story theme between Neo and Trinity, which is a very powerful dynamic. 
especially in Torah and Kabbalah, between uh, the bride, the uh, divine bride and divine groom coming together, these these spiritual aspects connecting with the divine bride being the 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 world, people, Israel, all of that, and the divine groom being either God or a representative of God or something like that. So that that, that theme's in there too, uh, which is um, interestingly that's the main theme to the book Song of Song of Song Shir Hashirim in the Bible, um, which. Uh, it's interesting because we're going to be doing that this summer. So this is all going to kind of connect. So there's a lot of messianic type concepts through these movies, and we're going to address them as they come up uh, from Torah and from the uh, um, Jewish oral Torah too, mostly, as I said, Kabbalistic stuff. So let's take a look here at one of the uh, key things. Boom. Everybody likes a good... I got to move something down. Yeah, there we go. All right. Um, so there's a thing um, in Kabbalah that um, existence, our reality, is actually structured a certain way. And let's see if I did this right. Okay, here we go. So this is how um, Kabbalah outlines how everything came to be. So there, you know, before the world, before anything, before time, there was only the creator. Call that God, call it the creator, whatever you want. We can't even define that. It's outside of existence because existence came about from the creator. So it's like the, what we could call the transcendent aspect of God. We can't really know anything about this other than things we can sort of derive from what is in existence. And then you have the first separate consciousness that came about from the creator, which is just simply existence, which is a lot of powers and forces and very beyond conceptual even even okay so it's very still very unified but but definable and then out of that comes creation okay and creation has three levels to it you have the the heavenly spiritual realm which is like the the heavenly temple the heavenly throne room and if this is of the world of uh of uh you know powers and forces that supervise everything you know in a, in a very uh what's that word I'm looking for, macro or overall scale. And then you have the world of angels, right? The angelic world, which goes up and down, like in the biblical story of Jacob's ladder. Uh, that's what we have here, you know, the angelic world connecting. And then, of course, down here, our good old planet, everything that we can see, everything that we can... Um, Oops, hold on, I have to mute somebody there because there was a mic on. Um, everything that we can see, touch, smell, taste, all that stuff, anything we can see with a telescope or microscope, that's our our physical world. Of course, there's spirituality in it, but we don't, most people don't think of that even or connect with it at all, uh, going around thinking that this is all there is to it. So there's a world of concealment that we live in where all these other spiritual worlds above us are, are hidden. And that's exactly the same structure as the matrix, here so we have the we'll go from the bottom up here so everybody in the movie that hasn't been awakened to this is in the matrix thinking that's the real world and it's not okay they're uh, asleep in this concealed world there's much more and and running this um running this world uh, and connecting it to what's beyond is their own version of the angelic world which is the program world so programs in the matrix story are equivalent to the angelic world in our reality. And then above that, in charge, if you will, is because she is, is a figure called the Oracle. And she's at this highest level that she connects down through the programs, uh, running them to properly supervise the human world because uh, she is uh, attuned to, to human. She understands all the psychological aspects, the uh, intellectual and psychological aspects and, and below of human beings. That's explained in the second movie, actually. Um, so, but she also connects, she's a higher, higher power. So she connects to what's above and beyond. So she's a very pivotal uh, linchpin, if you will, or point between creation and what's beyond. And then there's a figure that only shows up in the second movie. Although if you get a sharp eye, if you know the movies and you have a sharp eye, there's a scene uh, coming up in the first movie that shows a whole bunch of uh, 
uh, screens, um, com like computer monitors, looking at uh, Neo being as he's being dragged into for questioning, and all those screens show up in the second movie, and that's the uh, that's the architect actually looking in, and he's at this um, level that is before creation but within existence, and he calls himself the creator. He calls himself the creator of the Matrix, and calls himself the father of the Matrix, Abba, and then the Oracle is the mother, Ima, of the Matrix. Okay, this is all exactly what Kabbalah also says. When you're at that that level up here, um, this is the level of of the father. Uh, and then, of course, the funny thing is, is that this character of the architect is himself a program. He's the creator of everything below, of the creation below, right? But he himself is not really the true source of everything. The true source is called the source, uh, which is hidden away. People kind of know it's there. But there's not, they don't know a lot about it, hardly anything at all, really, in the Matrix storyline. Uh, I don't even know if it comes up in the first movie. I think it maybe only comes up in the second movie. Yeah, I believe so. Um, so this it corresponds to that pre-existent, transcendent aspect of a, the real creative force that includes like the, the will and desire of, which is a big deal, as I'll explain what's behind this movie, the will and desire of the true creator. So you can see here how the Matrix world set up is exactly the same as the Kabbalistic uh, setup of our reality. They're parallel, completely parallel to each other, okay? But this is the first template. This is the first and most important thing to understand is these five levels, okay? Concealment, programs, or angels, then the highest level within creation, oracle, heavenly realm, then something beyond creation that's existence but not yet creation, very unified level, and then that which we can't even really understand. All right, so that's our first template. And everybody loves a flying Neo. So, so corresponding to this, I have to move a couple of uh, windows out of the way here. Uh, yes to that question in the uh, in the chat. We'll get, we'll, I'll take a break in a while we can talk. So corresponding to these five levels that you just saw on the previous chart is the idea that that's more or less how how existence and creation came down from the creator down to us, that path, if you will, that structure is also our structure to connect back to the creator, back to God. So the structure that was designed down to us is the same structure going back for us, which we just did a meditation course for 16 weeks there, Luke and I did, which was all around this, okay? The, the, the structure is uh, makes you know, that type of meditation unique because you're not just sitting on a beach wondering, oh, whatever enters my mind. No, there's an actual path. So, and this is called the path of the one, by the way, in the movies. That's what this is all about. So the first, there's five levels of the soul that correspond to these five levels of existence and pre-existence that we just saw in the previous chart. And oops, here we go. And so this is what they look like from the bottom up. You start at the bottom. So the basic level of nefesh is just becoming aware of things, okay? And then once you're aware of things and you decide you're going to, you know, pursue that, you go into a level of struggle, which is the soul level of ruach. And then if you pursue that diligently enough, you do make some type of uh, true connection. You attain a level of uh, personal consciousness, if you will, and a connection with the with the higher powers with the creator, okay? And that's the neshama level. And that's generally what we deal with in life. I'm not going to get into this too, too much. It's for another day. And then outside of the neshama, outside of life, outside of creation, going into that next level above, the level of existence, that architect level, where things are very unified, is the level of chaya, which means life. And then beyond that is this mysterious level, which is a complete like unity with God, a very singular unity with God, our, our true origin outside of existence, which is, again, corresponds to the previous chart, which is uh, the Yehida level, okay? Now, I just moved these windows to the side, now I gotta move them back because, uh, all right, hold on, here we go. Uh, there we go. So this pattern, if you look on the left, awareness, struggle, connection, unity, and then some deep connection, Yehida. This pattern uh, is present in every Matrix movie. Well, first, let me back up a second. The first Matrix movie, which we're gonna look at tonight, is primarily, not exclusively, but primarily focused on awareness. Neo doesn't know anything. He becomes aware that there's this thing called the Matrix and there's a whole other reality and 
and even that he's the one, but he doesn't know what that means. So this movie is more or less focused on awareness. The second movie, which we'll look at in two weeks, where all these other characters and, and spiritual entities come in. Uh, I don't want to talk about it too much, spoil it, but uh, a whole lot of new things come in that he has to deal with. And it's even explained him. He's at this level of struggle and he has all kinds of new struggles, like compared to the first movie. The third movie is where the big connection happens. Literally at the end of the third movie, if any of you remember it, there is a big connection that does something. Uh, we'll get into that more later. And then the fourth movie was a very unified aspect. If you were at the Matrix movie we did a couple of weeks ago, we did the fourth movie. We'll do it again in a few weeks. Uh, everything starts coming together into that unified state. So all four movies relate to uh, the four levels so far uh, that we've covered tonight and what we've discussed in the last few minutes. Now, within each movie so that's you know movie one nefesh is the primary thing movie two ruach and so on but within each movie you neo experiences all five levels or all five i should say aspects of all five levels this is a concept called uh, inter uh, inter inclusive uh, is the word so each within the others okay if you do the omer count it's the same concept you're doing seven things but you're doing all seven within each one all seven within the next and so on so at the beginning of each movie neo's asleep he awakens with curiosity and questions then he experiences doubt struggle confusion he has to fight with people all this stuff and then he connects with the oracle and then uh which is that third level we looked at earlier and then he experiences he goes up and he experiences that unified level of a chaya that level of the soul which is a deeper unity with other people and then finally at the end of each movie he engages in a selfless selfless action uh where he dies first movie second movie third movie he technically dies in all three but again this is a midrash, so you got to look at what's really being said here. And he's not dying per se, like we would think of a death, but he's dying uh, to the level he was at, the level of the soul he was at, to get to the next one. You, you go through it, you can't stay there. You literally have to let go what you learned and experience to, to go to the next level, but it's a process. So these five steps that follow the five levels of the soul, that mirror the five levels of existence or the five worlds of existence, these are all going across like this. They're, um, they're all uh, follows this pattern in, in each of the movies, okay? So this is uh, this is very fundamental to understanding uh, everything that's going on. Um, let's see, where are we now? I forget where I am on my slides. Big white slide, oh, here it comes, okay. So when we look at this first movie tonight, Let's, we're at that nefesh level. Remember, it's primarily dealing with that first level, this movie, but he goes through all five within it. So we see that he starts, he doesn't know anything in the first movie and he wakes up. Every one of the first three movies, if you notice, he's asleep and he wakes up, all three. Um, so he's born in the matrix. He, he's, there's something wrong with the world that, that he thinks in his mind, but he doesn't know what. You'll hear that explained in the movie. So he meets uh, Morpheus, of course, if you haven't seen this. And then he, you know, it's one thing to hear about something, but you gotta, you gotta get, uh, you gotta walk, uh, was it walk the path or walk the walk? Um, so he has to uh, struggle in different ways. One struggle in terms of acceptance, because it's very hard to wake up to this, as you'll see, uh, that there's a whole other reality. <laughs> and he also has to struggle in terms of the way he learns how to learn about and deal with the matrix and that's shown actually a good part of that is thrown is shown through fighting fighting the fight scenes aren't silly they're actually meaningful in terms of engaging uh, in a struggle with something is how you get to understand it if you don't struggle with a person or a thing or a concept you won't truly understand it so that's what's going on in this movie as well um and yes of course take the red pill which has become symbolic in our in our culture our language for the last 20 years as something um We'll explain that more in a bit, too. And then, as uh, I said earlier, after this, at some point when he's kind of ready, he meets with the Oracle. The Oracle gives him, she gives him and everybody the information. Uh, how's it said? Uh, she tells you exactly what you need to hear at that moment. So she's this power from above that is, if you're true in, in terms of what you're seeking, if it's about, you know, if you're on the true path, uh, heaven will reward you. That's exactly what this says. She's at the level of the, the heavens. So heaven re rewards you with your next bit of information, what you need to keep moving forward. 
Uh, and then after this, his consciousness changes and he starts to see it's not just about him and the matrix. It's about the one is not just the one. The one is made up of, of many, of, all, of, of people, both in terms of those who he associates with, but also in a greater sense, all of humanity. So, so he starts to understand his relationship to how everything comes together. And then at the end of the first, second and third movie, he does give up. He reaches a point where he gives up his life. Um, martyrdom, which is associated with the level of uh, Yechida. I posted something today and yesterday on that. It's actually from a text by Rabbi uh, Schneerson of Pavad, um, where the level of, of uh, Yechida uh, is where you're willing to give up your life for God, because if nothing matters, you're just one with God. So it's interesting that that's exactly the flow. So this is how it plays out um, in the first movie, okay? Um I'm not even sure what's on my next slide. But that's, am I going the right way? Okay. So, so far we have the worlds of existence and we have these levels of the soul. Those are your two um, very related first two templates. And there's one more template, which is that at each of these levels, um, the creator God is present through everything. And God is, is present at each of these levels, of course. But it's because the levels are different and you could say it's almost like a different type of energy or it's a different type of experience or consciousness, but it's still God, but but present differently at each level. So our world, the angelic world, the heavenlies, etc. It's different, but it's still just the same God. So in the movies, um, I'm sorry, let me go back. Uh, within each of these levels, there are these characteristics or attributes or emanations, if you will, of, of the creator present at every level. They're, they're the same concepts are the same attributes, but they're, as I said, they're different at each level. And um, they're called emanations, they're called sephirot in Hebrew, okay? And in the movie, uh, the characters, some of which are human, some of which are programs, keep that in mind, um, these humans and programs uh, exhibit um, these emanations. Uh, the programs are pretty singular, as we'll see. The programs generally represent one particular attribute, more or less. Uh, humans, of course, we have the whole set, male, female, doesn't matter. We have the whole set of, of 10. And and uh, they don't always, they're not all the same uh, strength in every person. Some of us may be more one thing than the other, but it's still on the same scale. Or there may be some situations in life where, uh, as we see in the movie, where a certain attribute that wasn't so present suddenly becomes important and, and manifest, okay? So, for example, and also critical is the interactions between these emanations, as we'll see, between the people and the, and the uh, programs as well. So there are six in particular, six characters in this movie that are very critical to the story around Neo being the one, okay? Um, I don't know. I guess we could start at the bottom here. Um, oh, there we go. I have the diagram. So let's start at the bottom. There's a love story, as I mentioned, which is between he and Trinity. Uh, and she re represents one aspect of what's called the, the divine feminine or the Shekhinah, okay, in the world. She's his first contact, as you'll see in the movie here. And she's the one that tells him that uh, it's great the way she says it. Uh, and, and it's not just that they meet in the world, but they meet in this dark club very base, sexually oriented nightclub and all. It's like the lowest of the lower kind of, you know what I mean? And and that's where Neo makes the connection. It's really amazing to think, you know, all the way to the bottom, right? And then, and then up to the top. Uh, and she gives this great line, as you'll hear, she says, the, the answer is out there looking for you and you'll find it if you want to, if you pursue it. It's a fascinating way to put it, you know, the answer is out there. Um, and then the other character that's very meaningful is Morpheus. He plays, he's uh, primarily at the level of what is Yasod there. I'm sorry, I missed mentioning Malkut, right? Which is the our around our world kingdom. Um, Yasod is the beginning of the connection. It's actually the attribute has a lot to do with connectivity. And uh, he's uh, also a uh, representative of a truly righteous person that's helping elevate people out of the matrix world, right? Into the spiritual world. He's playing the role of a Zadik, a righteous person. Zadik always leans to the right side, which is Hesed, mercy on the right there. So, but I just put him down at Yesod, but he's also very strong. He's human, as I said, so they have multiple uh, aspects of these emanations. So um, Morpheus 
uh, also is lean, leans toward the side of Hesed. Okay, but but his his primary role is that of Yasod. So think of people in the Matrix being down there at Malkut at the bottom, and he helps pull them out, right? Like Neo and others, right? At Yasod and going up. Okay, and then of course Smith, everybody's favorite Agent Smith, who is probably in some ways probably the, maybe the most important character in the whole story, as we find out as the story develops over the, the four movies. Uh, he's at Gevora, which is the side of restriction. It's not evil or bad. It's restriction. So restriction can be good, right? And restriction can be bad. Um, but that's his. That's the concept or the power, the force he represents. Remember to keep thinking in terms of concepts through this whole movie, okay? Because he, like Neo, ends up seemingly to die and comes back and well how's that well these these concepts don't go away right people do but concepts don't so he's the fourth of force of restriction and of judgment as you'll see and the oracle above that also on the left mentioned her she's at this bina which is understanding the architect is over on the right at wisdom hokma okay wisdom hokma father and mother architect oracle they're called father and mother in the movie in the second movie you'll hear that um so those are the upper powers and then that mystical thing that people refer to i think again only in the second movie is the source where everything somehow emanated from and that gets really deep in this movie because this movie is not at all a movie about good guys and bad guys and enslavement that's just the that's just the midrash that's just the the shell okay the source is actually uh, the source actually, not to give too much away, in my opinion, at least, is has the perfect intention uh, for everything to work out. And there's a lot of things in the movie that don't make sense unless you think of it that way. It's like the Oracle figure. OK, is, is she about enslaving the humans and why is she helping? Right. That's a question that actually comes up in the uh, second movie. Neo asks her, well, why are you helping us if you're part of the system? That's the point. There's a the Matrix is a it's like our world. Right. So our world is here for us to bring repair to ourselves and, and to others and to the world and get back to where we started from and should be. Same with the matrix. It's all about the humans being in a place of recognizing what they need to fix and correcting it. So even the negative elements uh, like the Agent Smith and others are actually there to serve the ultimate purpose of the creator, of the source. Okay. So this is um so this is the uh the six main characters. Okay. Hi, Donna. Oh, Donna's coming in here. Hold on. All right. Did she come in? Oh, hi, Donna. Okay. So we're just a couple of uh, slides in, Donna. I can review them for you, uh, which is kind of critical, but I'll keep moving forward for now. Welcome. Um, all right. So let's uh, let's go to the next slide. I've got a couple more before we look at the beginning of the movie. This is important background information. Okay. So the first, the first movie, the first movie, the first slide we saw, the worlds of existence and the corresponding levels of the soul. And then within each level, you have these emanations that function, okay? And they're represented by the characters. So that's the basic foundation for, for all Kabbalistic teaching about our reality and all the Matrix movies, <laughs> excuse me. And if you go on the website, which is Matrix 4, number four, matrix4humans.com, I've got articles on all three of those, more extensive than what we're talking about now, and articles on most every topic that we're bringing up tonight. Excuse me. <clears throat> okay, so I'm just going to look at one or two characters here before we start the movie up. Um, as I mentioned, the key to the story or part of the key to the story is the love story between Trinity and Neo, who represents the divine feminine, divine masculine, although he's got to get there. Um, and so this is this is fundamental to the story. He, she is his first connection. She's the first gate, which is what Malkut is called down at the bottom. And Malkut is actually called the first gate. And uh, she is the entranceway um, for him to make his first connection that there's something beyond the world. Like he's scratching his head knowing something is more to life. And she's the first step. So he has to decide first whether he's going to be humble enough. Humility is key throughout, but especially at the beginning, humble enough to accept what she's saying and pursue it okay so she's a major a major uh, player um malkut shehina are also can be uh synonymous with ruach hakodesh holy spirit in a lot of uh writings from the second temple era um i'm off script here so 
a lot of the writings, they're, they're very synonymous. And what's funny is that Ruach, HaKodesh, and Shekhinah, Malkut, they're all feminine. They're all feminine, not only terminology-wise, but they're all feminine in the, they're the, like the, either the bride or the daughter aspect, all feminine. And there's a funny line in the movie, I don't know if it's by accident, but when he meets her, you'll hear him say, I thought you were a guy. And she says, most guys, you know, most guys do. <laughs> it's like, you know, or thought, thought you were a guy because he had heard about her or him. And it's kind of, it's kind of funny, you know, in a way. Um, anyhow, let's get back on topic. So the path of the one begins at the Malkut, and is our world and ascends, ascends, ascends through these levels of the soul, through the four movies, all the way to the top. That's our path. That's every person's path is to head upwards closer to our creator. And um, all right, let's see here. A couple more slides. All right. So we'll just look at these two characters really quick. There's a very important element um, through all the movies, uh, which is that uh, element of choice, which, of course, is very important to us. Uh, it's written that everything is under uh, heaven except the fear of heaven or every, you know, uh, everything is put in our lives, our, our condition, okay, I call it our condition is put in our lives by our creator, our God, and our job is to choose how do we respond to this, and if we choose the right way, we, we advance. Uh, so choice is, is huge throughout these movies, uh, especially in the second movie, Neo even says this is all about choice. Um, so anyhow, early on, his first choice he has to make, he's at his computer, as you'll see, there's something on his computer screen, and he ends up going to the door because there's a knock on the door, and these two people are at the door, and some others are kind of interesting looking characters because they're on their way to a club, and uh, their names are, uh, he's called Choi in the movie, but it's spelled C-H-O-I, and that's Schwa, and her name is Du Jour, and you put them together, and that's a French phrase, the French phrase means Choi Du Jour, which is choice of the day. So it's just kind of interesting they named. There's so many of these little cute subtleties they put in these movies. I mean, they're, they're fun, but they're also meaningful. But but the, there's even deeper stuff, of course. So Choix du Jour, the choice of the day, shows up at his door. And Neo is inspired, as I'll just say that for now, to follow them where he's going. He doesn't even know where he's going. It's kind of like Abraham. He just doesn't know where he's going, but he knows he's supposed to go. And that's where he'll meet Trinity, as I said, in this nightclub, which is a very dark base nightclub, the lowest of the lowest within the matrix, okay? So there's our friend Schwan de Jour. Um, let's see here. So the, the pattern of the movies also, I know I, I don't want to keep adding too much, but there's, there's just so much. This really takes multiple nights to do, so I'm talking pretty fast. This is being recorded, and it is on the website. Um, so there's also another pattern that follows the same levels, and that's one of, first, your condition. That's like at the nefesh level. This is you know, what, what God gave you in life, good, bad, or the ugly, right? This is where you're at. Then comes choice, then comes connection, and then comes change. I call them the four C's. I actually have four articles on the website called the four C's. So, so the condi Neo's condition, he has a choice, and then he'll make a, a connection. And then through, through the experience of the movie, he'll encounter a big change in his own life. So just another way of, uh, of looking at it or considering it. All right, let's see what we got next here. Okay, we're almost at the end of the slides before. This is the last slide, and then we're going to actually look at the movie. So uh, a very iconic, uh, probably the number one iconic thing from the whole series of movies is the red pill, uh, which has been adopted into our culture, meaning you're now awake to things, but, but you're not. Even people who really believe they are awake to what's really going on in the world, you know, be it legit or conspiracies, whatever, it's still at a, it's still within the matrix, you know, you can take the smartest professor in the matrix movie, let's say, and they're in the matrix, they can be the most brilliant person in the matrix, but if they think that's what real reality is, they're still as lost as anyone else. So even the smartest people in the world today, from a spiritual standpoint, with all the PhDs in, that you want, or just in tune to the reality of what the government's really up to or whatever, however the red pill metaphor is being used these days, uh, are still dealing with things at a very uh, low level, put it that way. So the red pill is something taking you completely out of reality so that you can look back into reality. And that's, of course, what happens in the matrix. So, um, oh wait, here you go. here's the quote from the movie. If you take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland. There's your Alice in Wonderland metaphor. You stay in this mysterious 
path and Neo and uh, Morpheus says, I'll show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. So we're gonna, we're gonna really take a look at, you know, if you take the red pill, otherwise you take the blue pill and you just wake back up in your bed and you just go on with life thinking there's nothing more. All right, so this brings us, yes. Hey, there we go, Alice in Wonderland, free your mind. This is my pause slide so that we can start taking a look at the movie. So we're gonna look at the movie in chunks, about, about a half hour each, it's about two hours long, okay? There will be some more slides. This is an educational experience. Um, so we'll pause approximately every 30 minutes. There may be one or two places where I pause a, an extra time briefly, because it's like right before a critical conversation or something. So I don't wanna give you too much information to try to remember. And you know, you might not remember it when you get to the scene. So there'll be a few, ex a couple extra pauses here and there too. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. I am now going to attempt, um, attempt to um, play the movie. Uh, one last thing before we go, whenever this conversations between any character and Neo, the main character, Neo, those are the ones you really need to pay attention to. There's a lot of script, dialogue, and other things going on. But when Neo has these deeper conversations with Trinity, Morpheus, Smith, the Oracle, et cetera, the architect, these, these are the ones where the, a lot of the really deep concepts are, are put into the script, into the storyline. So just, just a thought to maintain as we look through these, okay? All right, so I'm going to now pause the share and I'm going to reshare the, um, the movie, if I do this right, share screen. So we're gonna run this about a half an hour and then we'll pause again. Oh, uh, let's see, oh yeah, I did it right. As long as I click the button for movie sound, we're good. And I did, all right, so hopefully this will go good. Can you guys hear and see this okay? Yeah. Is everything in place? You weren't supposed to relieve me. I know, but I felt like taking a shift. You like him, don't you? I like watching him. Don't be ridiculous. We're gonna kill him. You understand that? Morpheus believes he is the one. Do you? It doesn't matter what I believe. You don't, do you? Did you hear that? Hear what? Are you sure this line is clean? Yeah, of course I'm sure. you were given specific orders. Hey, I'm just doing my job. You give me that jurist my diction crap, you can cram it up your ass. The orders were for your protection. <laughs> I think we can handle one little girl. I sent two units. 
They're bringing her down now. You know, Lieutenant, your men are already dead. Morpheus, the line was traced, I don't know how. I know, they cut the hard line. There's no time, you're gonna have to get to another exit. Are there any agents? Yes. God damn it. You have to focus, Trinity. There's a phone at Wells and Lake. You can make it. Get up. She got out. It doesn't matter. The informant is real. Yes. We have the name of their next target. The name is Neo. We'll need a search running. It has already begun.
is it? Savior, man. My own personal Jesus Christ. You get caught using that. Yeah, I know. This never happened. You don't exist. Right. Something wrong, man? You look a little whiter than usual. My computer. It... You ever have that feeling where you're not sure if you're awake or still dreaming? Mm, all the time. It's called mescaline. It's the only way to fly. Just sounds to me like you know you need to unplug, man. You know, get some R and R. He wants to think to sure. Should we take him with us? Definitely. No, I can't. I have uh, work tomorrow. Come on, it will be fun. I promise. Neil. How do you know their name? I know a lot about you. Who are you? My name is Trinity. Trinity. The Trinity? That cracked the IRS base. That was a long time ago. Jesus. What? I just thought, um, you were a guy. Most guys do. That was you on my computer. How did you do that? Right now, all I can tell you is that you're in danger. I brought you here to warn you. What? They're watching you, Neo. Who is? Please just listen. I know why you're here, Neo. I know what you've been doing. I know why you hardly sleep. Why you live alone and why night after night. You sit at your computer. You're looking for him. I you know because I was once looking for the same thing. And when he found me, he told me I wasn't really looking for him. I was looking for an answer. It's the question that drives us here. It's the question that brought you here. You know the question, just as I did. The answer is out there, Nina. It's looking for you. And it will find you if you want it to. that you are special, that somehow the rules do not apply to you. Obviously, you are mistaken. <laughs> this company is one of the top software companies in the world because every single employee understands that they are part of a whole. Thus, if an employee has a problem, the company has a problem. The time has come to make a choice, Mr. Anderson. Either you choose to be at your desk on time from this day forth, or you choose to find yourself another job. Do I make myself clear? Yes, Mr. Reinhardt, perfectly clear.
Thomas Anderson? Yeah, that's me. Hello? Hello, Neo. Do you know who this is? Morpheus. Yes. I've been looking for you. I don't know if you're ready to see what I want to show you, but unfortunately you and I have run out of time. They're coming for you, Neo, and I don't know what they're going to do. Who's coming for me? Stand up and see for yourself. What, right now? Yes, now. Do it slowly. The elevator. Exactly as I say. Okay. The cubicle across from you is empty. What, what if they... Go, now. Stay here for just a moment. When I tell you, go to the end of the row the office at the end of the hall. Stay as low as you can. Go now. Good. Now, outside, there is a scaffold. How do you know all this? don't have time, Neo. To your left, there's a window. Go to it. Open it. You can use the scaffold to get to the roof. No way. No way. This is crazy. There are two ways out of this building. One is that scaffold. The other is in their custody. You take a chance either way. I leave it to you. This is insane. Why is this happening to me? What I do? Nobody. As you can see, we've had our eye on you for some time now, Mr. Anderson. It seems that you've been living two lives. 
One Life, your Thomas A. Anderson program writer for a respectable software company. You have a social security number, you pay your taxes, and you help your landlady carry out her garbage. The other life is lived in computers, where you go by the hacker alias Neo and are guilty of virtually every computer crime we have a law for. One of these lives has a future, and one of them does not. I'm going to be as forthcoming as I can be, Mr. Anderson. You're here because we need your help. We know that you've been contacted by a certain individual, a man who calls himself Morpheus. And whatever you think you know about this man is irrelevant. He is considered by many authorities to be the most dangerous man alive. My colleagues believe that I'm wasting my time with you, but I believe you wish to do the right thing. And we're willing to wipe the slate clean, give you a fresh start. And all that we're asking in return is your cooperation in bringing a known terrorist to justice. Wow, that sounds like a really good deal. But I think I got a better one. How about I give you the finger and you give me my phone call? No, Mr. Anderson. You disappoint me. You can't scare me with this Gestapo crap. I know my rights. I want my phone call. Tell me, Mr. Anderson, what good is a phone call if you're unable to speak? to help us, Mr. Anderson, whether you want to or not. This line is tapped, so I must be brief. They got to you first, but they've underestimated how important you are. If they knew what I know, you would probably be dead. What are you talking about? What? What is happening to me? You are the one, Neo. You see, you may have spent the last few years looking for me, but I've spent my entire life looking for you. Now, do you still want to meet? Yes. Then go to the Adam Street Bridge. Get in. What the hell is 
Jesus. It's necessary, Neil. For our protection. From what? From you. Take off your shirt. What? Stop the car. Listen to me, Copper Top. We don't have time for 20 questions. Right now, there's only one rule. Our way? Or the highway? Fine. Please, Neo. You have to trust me. Why? Because you have been down there, Neo. You know that road. You know exactly where it ends. And I know that's not where you want to be. APOC lights. Fly back. Lift up your shirt. What is that thing? I think you're bugged. Let me give you one piece of advice. Be honest. He knows more than you can imagine. At last. Welcome, Neil. As you no doubt have guessed, I am Morpheus. It's an honor to meet you. No. The honor is mine. Please, come, sit. I imagine that right now you're feeling a bit like Alice, tumbling down the rabbit hole. Hmm? Say that. I can see it in your eyes. You have the look of a man who accepts what he sees because he is expecting to wake up. Ironically, this is not far from the truth. Do you believe in fate, Neil? No. Why not? Because I don't like the idea that I'm not in control of my life. I know exactly what you mean. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life, that there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind, driving you mad. It is this feeling that has brought you to me. Do you know what I'm talking about? Matrix. Do you want to know what it is? The Matrix is everywhere. It is all around us. Even now in this very room. You can see it when you look out your window or when you turn on your television. You can feel it 
when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? That you are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch. A prison for your mind. <sighs> Unfortunately, no one can be told what the Matrix is. You have to see it for yourself. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Remember. All I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. Follow me. Hey, Park, are we online? Almost. Time is always against us. Please, take a seat there. designed to disrupt your input-output carrier signal so we can pinpoint your location. What does that mean? It means buckle your seatbelt, Dorothy, because Kansas is going bye-bye. dream, Neo, that you were so sure was real. What if you were unable to wake from that dream? How would you know the difference between the dream world and the real world? This can be what? Be real? It's going into replication. Hey, Bob, it's still nothing. It's gone. We're going to need a signal soon. Got a fibrillation. APOC, location. Targeting almost there. It's going into arrest. Lock, I got him. Now, tank, now.
We've done it, Trinity. We found him. I hope you're right. I don't have to hope. I know it. Am I dead? Far from it. He still needs a lot of work. What are you doing? Your muscles have atrophied. We'll be building them. Why am I, sir? You've never used them before. Rest, Neil. The answers are coming. Okay, we're pausing for a moment here. I'm going to uh, share back a couple of slides. What I'm going to do is uh, we're going to have about a 22 minute segment coming up after this, and then we'll take a longer, a, a bit more of a break. People can get a drink, use the restroom, whatever you got to do. Uh, hold on, let me find my slideshow. Here it is. Um, okay, so in a second here, we should be back on the slide with Alice, right? All right, um, participants, and let me get the chat box open too. Okay, so we'll. Uh, so if you have some questions, um, jot them down or put them in the chat. But I'll get to them at halftime. I'll call it halftime in about twenty-two minutes after this. Um, so as we see, Neo is just that first stage we mentioned earlier on the slides. Like, why don't I just go back really quick here, just for the benefit of those who did not see this. Where are we here? I gotta go all through this. Okay, here we go. So as we said, there's these different levels of the soul. Each movie is kind of focused on one. The first movie is very much focused on awareness and the you know, nefesh level, but there's all five levels within each one. So here we have the first one we've gotten through where he's the splintered his mind and he has to make his first choice. So he's going here kind of transitioning from the first nefesh within the nefesh level to the second one where he's going now into a realm here of uh, the realm of struggle where he has to start dealing with the choice he made so uh symbolically like with with people in our own world that might feel there's something more to the world and start seeking spiritual answers sometimes people really go for it and stay on it but other times they uh they don't other times they um they just get more confused or they back or they, what do you call it? Go backwards, you know? So, but he's now about to go into this level of, of, of struggle or a choice that he, based on the choice he made, uh, which as we will see is um, a couple of different types of struggle. One, just simply accepting all of the, the things that come with this uh, on a mental, emotional level, but also um, in terms of actual, um, uh, the part of the process of struggling with things is you have to deal with it. So that symbolically, as we'll see, has a lot to do with uh, some of the training he will have to go through, which is uh, ends up being uh, kind of a fighting with Morpheus, but not in a bad sense. Anyhow, okay. So moving forward here into this next section that we're going into, some more of the concepts start coming in. They're going to start coming in much more rapidly through the movie, as well as in the subsequent movies. Um, so what we're looking, you should be looking at Morpheus holding the battery right here, right? If you want to just put yes in the chat, I just want to make sure we're on the same page. So the whole concept of the uh, of the battery here, uh, it's very explained very simply in this movie in terms of the machines have the humans in these pods and they use them for energy and turns them like symbolically into a battery. Yes, true. It's not really until the fourth movie that we understand this more fully, but I'll give you a little heads up now. And that this is symbolic to people who are going around in the world today, completely not, not thinking about anything spiritually at all. And they're easily manipulated, if you will, by any spiritual forces that are trying to manipulate us or them. And there's basically two categories of manipulation. And this is found through Torah literature. Uh, one is fear, 
and the other is uh, uh, desire. So you're either taken off the path because you know something's difficult, dangerous, and it's you know all of that, or you're taken off the path through temptation in the other way. So those are the two main ways that we go astray. And as it will be explained, uh, I think I don't think it's really fully explained till the fourth movie, actually, that fear and desire are the two ways that um, uh, that the other side, the uh, in the movie, the 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 dark side, if you will, controls human beings. So it's not just energy; it's that they do things to 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 human beings that cause a type of energy to um, emerge, either from fear or desire, which then energizes the other side, the evil realm, if you want to call it that. I prefer to call it the the uh, the other side. All right. So Neo's going into uh, oh, in the last scene, by the way. Uh, Interesting that the, just simply how the way he explained the matrix to Neo, he said that it's uh, everywhere. You know, he said, "Well, what's the matrix? Oh, it's everywhere." It sounds silly, doesn't it? He says it's, it's a world pulled over your eyes, but that literally is how the world of concealment is def in Torah literature is explained. The world we're in now, right? I mean, if you're the average person that has no spiritual insights going around, they think everything's just the way it is, and it's completely pulled over their eyes. That's that's a, a great uh, analogy there. Um, all right, so we're going to see this battery scene come up. As I said, it's kept kind of simple in the first movie here. You're also going to hear Morpheus talk about something very spiritual called a prophecy. And of course, prophecy is a big deal, especially in uh, with relation to uh, the Bible and all of that. And uh, he talks about uh, one that's coming to free people and end the matrix. As I mentioned earlier, the matrix is really, when you look at it you know, at a deeper level, the matrix is where the humans are in order to correct what they got wrong or what's wrong within them. It's the, the process called tikkun, repair, okay? Same same with us. We're in this world that we're in right now. This is not the, the real world, so to speak. There's greater, let's say, hidden spiritual dimensions, and this is not where we're going to stay forever. There's an afterlife, and all same same idea, okay? So, um, so as long as you keep that in mind, it's a main point of understanding the matrix at this level is that that the matrix is here is for a reason. Te technically, you could almost say it's it's good for the humans because they were a mess. And it's the matrix that gives them opportunity, if you will, to uh, to straighten themselves out. And, and then the matrix won't be needed anymore. OK, so the prophecy is uh, that one day someone is coming that is going to help get rid of the matrix and uh, free people. And that whole process is far more complicated, uh, both in the movie and in uh, literature, Torah literature, Kabbalistic literature, uh, than most realize. Particularly the idea, and this comes up only again later, third, fourth movie, that there's stages to re the redemption. And the first three movies of The Matrix are the first stage. And then there's a, a interim period. And then there's a final stage. That's actually in uh, a text called uh, Secrets of the Redemption by a, a, a rabbi a couple hundred years ago, uh, Moshe Haim Lozado, called the Ram Kal. And he explains how the redemption process works out. And it's identical to the, the movies, including the gap between the third and the fourth movies, which is absolutely fascinating. All right, then, um, let's see. So the, this is a... Okay, Sitra Akhra is the other side. It's the side that is, uh, I hate to call it evil realm because it's all, obviously everything serves God's purpose, right? But it's the, the other side that is opposing us. But it's, again, the opposition is put there by God as well, the creator, so that we can cause, it causes us to change, to look deeper and to seek, seek God, seek the source, okay? So same concept. Uh, I forgot to move the slides along here. So yeah, the prophecy, as I mentioned, as you'll hear, that there's one uh, who came and he's coming back again, which is interesting the way it's expressed. It's expressed as almost like the same person or the same soul, if you will. Uh, and then a real interesting concept comes up here. Uh, there's a word in Hebrew called da'at, which means uh, to know or knowledge, but it's not like brain uh, things you learn. It really means uh, connection. It means intimate connection is what da'at means. So in the Bible, for example, uh, when Adam and uh, had relations with his uh, with the woman Hava Eve, right? It says he knew her. It's the word is da'at in in there. Uh, Daniel twelve four knowledge will increase. It's da'at. It's all, anytime there's an intimate connection being made and. You see this again, it's another concept that's through these movies that reaching this this level of da'at. 
So in the top left, uh, these are four clips, four scenes, or I should say images from four different movies, the, the four different Matrix movies. In the top left, you'll see it in this scene coming up where he's trying to get Neo to make this connection to what the reality is. And he tells him, don't think you are, know you are. Make that, that da'at connection. Below and to the left bottom is uh, 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 the Asian man there is uh, Seraph, who uh, he actually is the guardian of the Oracle and you would meet him in the second movie. And he says, you don't know someone, so you don't connect with them. I mentioned this earlier, until you fight them or struggle with them. So if if I meet you and we both sitting around the table and I say, isn't God great? And you say, yes, God is great. You know, we really don't know anything about each other. It's just kind of a sentiment. But if we start talking in detail and we have differences of opinion, now I, I'm struggling with you, right? We're going to debate or whatever. Now I get to know you. So that's the concept here on a personal level uh, that's introduced in that second one. Up in the top right column, when he's in the Oracle's apartment in the third movie, he sees the sign, Temet no se, which is Latin for know thyself, which is making, again, make the connection to your true self. So we are made in what's called uh, the image of God uh, in the Genesis 1, Bet Salem Elohim. Okay, we're made in something called the image of God, all right? And we need to return to that true image of God. So there's a word in Hebrew called teshuva, which means to return, which means actually to return to your true self. And so Neo has to return to his, uh, his true self. This is also seen in the Bible with Abraham. And it's weird because this, this, when, when Morpheus talks about the prophecy, it almost sounds like Abraham a little bit. It could also sound like Moses. But but um, in, the, in the Bible where it talks about Abraham, uh, in the Hebrew Bible, it's organized by sections called uh, uh, Parshot or uh, the Parsha for the week or the reading for the week. And the one with Abraham is called Lech Lecha, which is return to yourself. Return to It's the same as Temet No Say. It's know yourself, return back to yourself. So that's kind of interesting. And the bottom right, we won't get into too much right now, but that's from the fourth movie where there's another scene where um, Neo is dealing with somebody, which I won't get into, but it's the same idea where it's all about uh, an intimate connection that needs to be established. So, so you'll see this word know or knowing appear throughout the movies consistently. It's another one of those themes that shows up quite, uh, quite a bit. Um, let's see here. I think I have one or two more slides here. So as I mentioned earlier, this is not a movie about bad guys and good guys like most movies are. The things that show up in the movie, either as a threat, such as Agent Smith to the right here with the gun. This is a simulation, of course, but anything, the threats. And in the second movie, you'll meet the other side, which is that I mentioned that the, the uh, side of desire or temptation, that's the Merovingian character. He shows up in the second movie. So Smith and Merovingian are the two sides of the Sitra Achra, one threatening and one tempting, okay, which is symbolic of the uh, figure of Hasetan or Satan, who is a accuser and, and destroyer. And that's the Smith character, which we'll get to. I'll show you more about that in a minute. And... Um, the uh, Merovingian is more like the serpent character in the Garden of Eden story. There are aspects of the Sitra Akra. All those things in the Torah are also aspects, different aspects of the other side. They're all a little different, but they're all connected. So barriers are there just as a means to, as, as we hear this all the time, the things that have, what is that saying? If it doesn't, if it doesn't kill you, it'll make you stronger, right? It's kind of like that. So barriers in the matrix are the same thing. Uh, they're there as a means to learn something, overcome it, and advance. That they're there for a purpose, ultimately a good purpose for the humans. Then, see one more slide, I think. Yeah. <laughs> then, of course, there's an aspect here, which I mentioned earlier, that Morpheus plays in the role of the Zadik, the connection between the, the matrix world and the, the real world, or the even the program worlds. So the Z, the Zadik, which is righteous person. Um, has a, a great deal of uh, wisdom and power and, and is aligned with the will of God, uh, if you will. And so Morpheus is uh, very much in this role, but so is Neo to a, an extent, or he can be or will be. Uh, that's part of the whole process here, too. And um, he mentions, um, well, there's a, there's a cool scene coming up here where he tells Neo that um, you won't have to even dodge the bullets which is, you know, true in the sense in the movie, but but also in metaphorically, I guess is the word, uh, in terms of being uh, above these things that can 
you know, harm you because you're at a higher elevated spiritual level, which you got to get to. You got to work to get there. It's just not a matter of believing and, and there you got it. It's it's constant path at an advancement along the path or levels of the soul, et cetera. And so this is a, this is an important concept to keep in mind. So I'm not going to go talk too much more. This is going to be only about 22 minutes, as I said, I think, or 23. And uh, hold on, let me see. Yeah, we're stopping at the 59 marks. Yeah, it's about 22 minutes. Um, so then we'll pause for a little break, get some drinks or whatever you need and have a little chat on questions and all, okay? So uh, I'm going to resume, I think, let me just check my next slide, make sure it's nothing significant. Okay, yeah, Neo and the cookies, yeah, okay. So this is a cookie break slide, here we go. So not yet, we gotta watch the movie, then we're gonna take the cookie break. All right, I hope you like that slide, it's one of my favorites. Okay, so I'm gonna pause the share here and go back to the movie. I hope you're all comfortable. Like I said, it's only about 22 minutes and then we'll take a, a longer break. What's happened to me? What is this place? More important than what is when. When? You believe it's the year 1999, when in fact it's closer to 2199. I can't tell you exactly what year it is, because we honestly don't know. There's nothing I can say that will explain it for you, Neo. Come with me. See for yourself. This is my ship, the Nebuchadnezzar. It's a hovercraft. This is the main deck. This is the core. Where we broadcast our pirate signal and hack into the matrix. Most of my crew, you already know. This is APOC. Switch. Cypher. The ones you don't know, Tank and his big brother Dozer. The little one behind you is Mouse. You wanted to know what the Matrix is, Neo? Trinity. This is the construct. It's our loading program. We can load anything from clothing to equipment, weapons, training simulations, anything we need. Right now, we're inside a computer program? Is it really so hard to believe? Your clothes are different, the plugs in your arms and head are gone. Your hair has changed. Your appearance now is what we call residual self-image. It is the mental projection of your digital self. This isn't real. What is real? How do you define real? If you're talking about what you can feel, what you can smell, 
touch, you can taste and see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. This is the world that you know. The world as it was at the end of the 20th century. It exists now only as part of a neural interactive simulation that we call the matrix. You've been living in a dream world, Neo. This is the world as it exists today. of information but what we know for certain is that at some point in the early 21st century all of mankind was united in celebration we marveled at our own magnificence as we gave birth to ai ai you mean artificial intelligence a singular consciousness that spawned an entire race of machines we don't know who struck first us or them but we know that it was us that scorched the sky. At the time, they were dependent on solar power, and it was believed that they would be unable to survive without an energy source as abundant as the sun. Throughout human history, we have been dependent on machines to survive. Fate, it seems, is not without a sense of irony. The human body generates more bioelectricity than a 120 volt battery and over 25,000 BTUs of body heat. Combined with a form of fusion, the machines had found all the energy they would ever need. There are fields, endless fields, where human beings are no longer born. We are grown. For the longest time, I wouldn't believe it. And then I saw the fields with my own eyes. Watched them liquefy the dead so they could be fed intravenously to the living. And standing there, facing the pure, horrifying precision, I came to realize the obviousness of the truth. What is the Matrix? Control. The Matrix is a computer-generated dream world built to keep us under control in order to change a human being into this. No. I don't believe it. It's not possible. I didn't say it would be easy, Neil. I just said it would be the truth. Stop! Let me out! Let me out! I want out! Easy, Neo. Easy, Neo. Take this thing. Don't touch me. Get away from me. Stay away from me. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. He's gonna pop. Breathe, Neo. Just breathe. can't go back, can I? No. But if you could, would you really want to? I feel I owe you an apology. We have a rule. We never free a mind once it's reached a certain age. It's dangerous. The mind has trouble letting go. I've seen it before, and I'm sorry. I did what I did because I had to. When the Matrix was first built, there was a man born inside who had the ability to change whatever he wanted, 
to remake the Matrix as he saw fit. It was he who freed the first of us, taught us the truth. As long as the Matrix exists, the human race will never be free. After he died, the Oracle prophesied his return, and that his coming would hail the destruction of the Matrix, end the war, bring freedom to our people. That is why there are those of us who have spent our entire lives searching the Matrix, looking for him. I did what I did because I believe that search is over. Morning. Did you sleep? No, tonight. I guarantee it. I'm a tank. I'll be your operator. You don't. You don't have any holes? Nope. Me and my brother Dozer were both 100% pure, old-fashioned, homegrown human, born free right here, in the real world. Genuine child of Zion. Zion. If the war was over tomorrow, Zion's where the party would be. It's a city. Last human city. The only place we have left. Where is it? Deep underground, near the Earth's core, where it's still warm. If you live long enough, you might even see it. God damn. I, I gotta tell you, I'm, I'm fairly excited to see what you're capable of. If Morpheus is right, no. I'm not supposed to talk about this. But if you are, exciting time we got a lot to do we gotta get to it now we're supposed to start with these operation programs first that's major buffering shed let's do something a little more fun how about combat training program, similar to the programmed reality of the Matrix. It has the same basic rules, rules like gravity. What you must learn is that these rules are no different than the rules of a computer system. Some of them can be bent. Others can be broken. Understand? Then hit me, if you can. Which your weakness 
is not your technique. Who is this fighting Neo? How did I beat you? You're too fast. Do you believe that my being stronger or faster has anything to do with my muscles in this place? You think that's air you're breathing now? Again. Jesus Christ, he's fast. T take a look at his neurokinetics. They're way above normal. What are you waiting for? You're faster than this. Don't think you are. Know you are. Come on, stop trying to hit me and hit me. trying to do I'm trying to free your mind Neo but I can only show you the door you're the one that has to walk through it Hank load the jump program you have to let it all go Neo fear Doubt and disbelief. Free your mind. Whoa. Okie dokie. Free my mind. But what if he makes it? Never made the first jump. I know, I know. But what if he does? He won't. Come on. Right. No problem. Free my mind. Free my mind. No problem. Right. What does that mean? It doesn't mean anything. Everybody falls the first time. Right, friend? I thought it 
wasn't real. Your mind makes it real. If you're killed in the Matrix, you die here? The body cannot live without the mind. There's something about it, isn't there? Don't tell me you're a believer now. I just keep wondering if Morpheus is so sure. Why isn't he taking to see the Oracle? Morpheus will take him when he's ready. The Matrix is a system, Neo. That system is our enemy. When you're inside, you look around, what do you see? Businessmen, teachers, lawyers, carpenters, the very minds of the people we are trying to save. But until we do, these people are still a part of that system, and that makes them our enemy. You have to understand, most of these people are not ready to be unplugged. And many of them are so inert, so hopelessly dependent on the system, that they will fight to protect it. Were you listening to me, Neo? Or were you looking at the woman in the red dress? I was... Look again. Freeze it. This... This isn't the Matrix? No. It's another training program designed to teach you one thing. If you are not one of us, you are one of them. What are they? Sentient programs. They can move in and out of any software still hardwired to their system. That means that anyone we haven't unplugged is potentially an agent. Inside the Matrix, they are everyone and they are no one. We have survived by hiding from them, by running from them. But they are the gatekeepers. They are guarding all the doors, they are holding all the keys, which means that sooner or later, someone is going to have to fight them. Someone. I won't lie to you, Neil. Every single man or woman who has stood their ground, everyone who has fought an agent has died. But where they have failed, you will succeed. Why? I've seen an agent punch through a concrete wall. Men have emptied entire clips at them and hit nothing but air. Yet their strength and their speed are still based in a world that is built on rules. Because of that, they will never be as strong or as fast as you can be. What are you trying to tell me? That I can dodge bullets? No, Neo. I'm trying to tell you that when you're ready, you won't have to. Okay. Morpheus is not frozen. I paused the movie. Uh, welcome for those of you who just arrived. Um, this is being recorded, so hopefully we'll uh, get uh, permission again to put it on YouTube. Uh, a couple quick things, and this is what we're going to do. A couple very quick things on what we just saw that I scribbled, because I every time I watch this, there's something else to write down. Then we'll take a minute or two to you know use the bathroom and get a drink or snack, food or whatever. And then we'll come back, and if there's a few questions here at halftime. We're at halftime, by the way. We're at the one-hour mark almost. Uh, we'll, we'll entertain a few questions and, uh, and then go from there. Okay, so just a couple things real quick. It's interesting that he says the Oracle prophesied about the one that would come. And yet the Oracle is one of these programs. And this goes back to what I said earlier, that you have to look at this story, the whole Matrix story, completely different, just like our own reality in that they are in the Matrix, just like we are in this world as a place to effect repair and get back to where we were once were and, and are meant to be. So it's even the people that or the programs or people or anything in these movies that seem to be antagonistic. It's all just part of one master plan. There's only one power. 
right? In the Hebrew, that's Enod Milvado. There's only one power. Keep that in mind through this whole movie, and that eventually it will become clearer and clearer through the movies that there's there's much more behind the scenes here. So the the Oracle is both uh, part of keeping the Matrix going, but she's also an agent to get to the uh, the future, as she says in the next movie, uh, and the end of the the Matrix. Um, so you see things like that that are a little hard to understand if you don't look at the movie from this capitalistic perspective. Just like uh, Agent Smith, the ultimate bad guy, he reveals more truth. He reveals more true things through these movies than any other character. He doesn't lie. He, he tells the truth. And it's quite amazing to hear him say that. Now, he's limited to his understanding. That's why he gets it wrong. So he understands like 99% of things, but it's that last 1% that... It turns the tables on him and gets, you know, I don't want to say too much, but uh, but so things like that that are kind of mysterious. Uh, it's interesting that Tank, the guy that came in to talk to Neo, says about Zion, a lot of biblical references here. He says, uh, if the war ended, uh, Zion would be where the party's at. And if you look in the, is it an Isaiah in the Bible? I forget. You'd have to go find it. But it talks about when it's uh, at the end of the day, Zion will be where the party is that it doesn't say party, of course, but it says that there'll be great rejoicing and stuff like that in Zion. It's kind of interesting. They, they took that out of there. Um, and again, Morpheus tells Neo that you're the, you know, I can only show you the door. You have to walk through it. You have to take the steps. So this is that advancement through the soul levels. And Luke is here. We just did a more meditation study on, based on these same soul levels that Neo is going through. So that that's the walk, the steps of Neo through each movie. First movie, nefesh level second movie rock level and so on so and and everything in the movies aligns perfectly with these themes um and then of course trinity says that he will go see the oracle morpheus will take him to see the oracle when he's ready so you can't take shortcuts in the spiritual advancement you have to learn and walk and do things a step at a time which then merits you to get to the next stage there's there's no shortcuts everything has to be done as as design and as we saw at the beginning if you weren't here we showed those first slides there is a design there's a framework at, at how everything was created and that's the same framework we follow to go back it's it's unavoidable or, or as smith would say it's inevitable um and then the other interesting comment here he makes uh to neo just a few seconds ago here he says of the agents he says they're the gatekeepers Okay, that's a real interesting idea uh, that they're the ones that you got to get past or get by. So that's effectively almost, you know, it, yeah, you could say almost like, um, and you know, spiritual entities. You could almost think of it too as like a clepot or things that cover or, or you know prevent, you know, that have to be uh, dealt with. And um, there's certain things that you can deal with when you're at one level, and as you advance, you can deal with at another level. But ultimately there is this like messianic character that can uh, in the form of Neo that can deal with things that a, uh, he kind of forges the path, if you will, deals, deals with things at a much uh, higher level than the average Joe. And it, that's something that's written about in a lot of texts. Um, in uh, there's a Rabbi Nachman of Breslov, you may or may not have heard of. Um, there's a book out, uh, he was a few hundred years ago, but there's a book called Mash Mashiach, Messiah Mashiach, who, what, when, where, how, why. And in the author is Chaim Kramer with a K. And in that book, it talks about um, the, um, I lost my train of thought. Uh, but it talks about the soul of Mashiach being uh, unique, a very, a very unique one uh, that can descend to the lowest realms, like we saw Neo in the nightclub, right? The very lowest of the low, uh, all the way to the source, all the way to the highest realms. The highest of the highest. In fact, uh, Nachman calls uh, his soul, the Mashiach soul, coming from the catcher of catcher. So the highest of the highest. So, And that's why it, it can descend to the lowest and bring everything together. So all these themes I'm talking about are, are in the movie. Um, all right. So I'm going to pause here for like a minute or two. So if you want to run, get a drink, use the restroom, whatever, do that right now. Then we'll come back, have a couple minutes for questions, and then resume. Okay. So I'm gonna. I'm just going to uh, do that myself. Get a drink, and I'll meet you back here in about sixty seconds or so.
get me back on screen for a minute here. Let's see my smiling face and my cool kitty background. The Matrix cats behind me are actually a, a design my wife made, and uh, it's uh, we we uh, obviously we we have some. Uh, I'm not promoting this. Here. <laughs> we have some mer matrixy merchandise we sell. Just to we don't make like money off it, uh, but just to raise awareness because it's got the the website on it and all. So she made the matrix cat with the code inside. And if you zoom in, you can't right here. But if you zoom in on the code, it's actually well, it's it's a form of Hebrew. It's called Rashi script. It's in the Talmud, and it's a type of you know Hebrew. And she took that and played around with it, spun some of them around. Did, colorize and did weird things turned it into matrix code and and then we put it inside the cat image where she did pretty uh pretty talented <laughs> so that's our own code that we uh yeah we have a well, i don't have a matrix shirt on tonight uh, i've got one with uh, at the at the alice in wonderland where she's pulling the curtain aside so it's public domain image so i took the behind the curtain and i put all the matrix code in there it was our matrix code um so there's always a balance when these evenings between them going too late and and yet trying to cover so much of these concepts and themes, and of which I leave a lot of little things out. As I said, the Matrix for Humans site, uh, M-A-T-R-I-X, number four, humans, plural, dot com, has a, well, a knowledge base, has about 60 articles in it. And then there's another section called Resurrections with another nine or 10 articles based on the new movie. And then some other stuff. Thank you, Luke. So that that's uh, that's your course right there. If you want to take the course, uh, that that's it there. It's basically it's a a course on on Kabbalistic and Hasidic ideas uh, as explained through the the midrashic vehicle of the Matrix movies. Which again, I can't explain why these movies have all this stuff in it. If you were to take all of this knowledge from the past two thousand years or whatever. And, you know, all of these deep Kabbalistic Hasidic texts and say, hey, let's put it all together and, and turn it into a modern movie, maybe science fiction, you get the matrix, okay, it, you just would. Uh, there are other crazy people that say the same thing I'm saying, uh, including one rabbi, uh, Gideon Holland, like the country, he, uh, if you search Gideon Holland, and put in uh, matrix Kabbalah or something like that, he put a, he has a 10 part video series. Um, I think it's all in the first movie, though. He and another gentleman are talking about these scenes. It's in Hebrew with English captions. Make sure you have the captions on. Okay. So, so there are there's a lot of a number of people out here using themes. It's very obvious Kabbalistic themes. There's a number of rabbis and stuff using this, but but uh, I'm the crazy person who back in 2003 with my wife decided um we showed this to our we have a Torah group that meets every week, friends. We've, we've been meeting for 26 years now. And uh so that goes back to when, I don't know, 1997, I think. Um, so we we showed this movie once to our friends and it, the funniest thing happened, we started looking at the Matrix movie like almost every time we got together to have a Torah study for like a year. That's how I really develop a lot of material going back and forth with them and all. And um, so um, um, anyhow, that's, Back to, so that's 20 years now, yeah, 2003 to 2023 when we started doing that. So when we do a Torah study, we talk about Matrix, or we'd watch the Matrix movie and we'd break into a Torah study. It would just go back and forth and back and forth every time we get together. Was, so if you're ever at my place, you can be guaranteed you'll be talking about the Matrix. You have plenty to eat. I might even hand you a beer. <laughs> so it's very casual, but we get into some really great stuff. All right, now. Let's see, without getting too, too mystical here, any, I'm looking back, see if there's any like kind of more specific questions with shorter answers. And there's a lot of movies that might, you know, have these themes, but like I said, you'll find movies that, out there that have two or three themes. The Matrix, we've already covered, I don't know, 40, 50 different little themes, and there's much more to come, and there's all the movies, and then you see how it's all interconnected, and it's on a timeline. It's on the actual timeline of our existence, according to the Kabbalists, right? The, the matrix, our matrix is only supposed to be around 6,000 years. And even that gets tweaked. That's that's what's written from the point. Uh, and that's not like existence in the, uh, the universe. The universe is billions of years old, but from the point of uh, the Garden of Eden where they get kicked out to the last possible date for the Mashiach to come in the Messianic era, supposedly 6,000 years of human history. That's what's taught. 
And, and that's interesting because that theme comes up in the matrix too. So um looking here, da -da -da, yeah, books, movies. Yeah, okay. So um if there's a, a kind of more specific type question that doesn't go need a, a big long esoteric discussion, you can post it in the chat before we restart. Um I'm gonna pause the share. I'm gonna open up our wonderful slideshow. We are, oh, I gotta go back here. I messed up here, hold on, okay. Share screen, I forgot to hit the share screen button. Okay, um, where are we? Hold on a second. While you do that, I'm gonna fix this slideshow. Here we go. From current slide. I'm going back to you guys here in a second here, Taskbar. All right. Here we go. Uh, where are we? It still didn't work. I don't know why I didn't do that. Cookie break. Okay. Okay, slideshow from current slide. Where are we? Now, let's get our cookie, our cookies back up here. It is not cooperating. Oh, there we go. All right, you guys should be seeing the cookie slide here in a second. Hopefully you are. I'm gonna open up a chat box and in two. You get the cookie slide? All right, yeah, this is my favorite slide. Because they're chocolate chip cookies. All right, so what's coming up? So we're, we're halfway through the movie here and uh, we haven't even met the Oracle yet. And that's gonna get crazy. Um, the Oracle is key. She is that entity that connects to all programs and humans below or all of creation below, but also connects back to the beginning. So she's that middle point if, in a sense. She's also at the soul level of Neshama, which is the, the highest we generally reach in life. But again, Neo goes through aspects of all five within the Nefesh first level. Then the second movie goes through the same five aspects within the Ruach and, and so on. So you have multiple levels of the soul, but then as we mentioned, you go through each one within each one in each movie. All right, so what's coming up here? Our character of Cypher is coming back. Too many things on the window here. I'm gonna minimize myself here. And... Uh, participants there we go so cypher is returning if you know anything about him he's got issues <laughs> um what's interesting is he'll, he'll tell neo at one point i got advice to you if you see an agent run but cypher is coming up it's coming from the perspective of like maintaining the matrix which is a bad thing you know run don't don't try to fight deal with it and bring things to a head to end the matrix so he's actually giving bad advice uh, in respect to the fact that the matrix is only supposed to be here for a while to serve its purpose just like the world we live in is only supposed to be here for a while to serve its purpose um so anything promoting the continuation of the matrix world be it agent smith and the side of fear or in the next movie, the Merovingian and the side of uh, desire and pleasure, anything that maintains a matrix, that status quo is a bad thing, you know, it, and whether it goes the easy route or the hard route, I think it's the third movie, the Oracle says to him, one way or another, it's going to end, she says, which is pretty cool. Um, so you have uh, these type of characters, human and programs that are, uh, are in here uh, opposing the idea of ending the matrix. I'm just keeping it going. Um, okay, so there's going to be a scene coming up here where they're on their way to uh, see after Cypher. Uh, there's a scene where they're going to see the Oracle and they're in the car. And it seems rather innocuous. There's a little conversation between Neo and Trinity. And he asks her, what, it, well, what, did, the what did the Oracle tell you? Because she's seen the Oracle. And she goes to answer but stops. And it's very significant. Um, just hold that thought, okay? The thought that he, he she stops what she wants to tell him because there is something very specific that you only hear at the end of the movie, but she can't tell him yet. And you'll find out why later too. And um, all right, so so that's coming up. Um, 
and then he gets to the uh, Oracle's apartment and he um, he has to wait. And there's these little kids in there. They're doing all kinds of incredible things and they're called uh, potentials. So they're like potential like Neos or potential messiahs, if you will. And because they have some abilities or prophets or something like that, you know, they're potentials, um, which is interesting because the 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 Hebrew word hokma is made of two words, koach and ma, which mean basically potential of what is or potential of what can be. So that's kind of kind of fascinating that they use the word potentials there. Um, okay, so let's see here. I think that's about it before we restart. Um, oh yeah. Um, I have a couple of slides I wanted to show you here. I kind of overlook. Can't stand the cookies. Oh, this guy. We all know this guy. Spoon Boy. And he says, Neo meets him and this is an interesting exchange. He's doing a little spoon bending trick. He says, don't try to bend a spoon. That's impossible. Only realize the truth. Neo says, what truth? And then he, he gives this famous, now iconic line from the movie. If I can get my program to work here. There is no spoon. He was like, what do you mean you're holding this? But there is no spoon. And then he says uh, to Neo, he says, um, he says, realize the deeper truth. He says, you'll see that it's not the spoon that bends, it's only yourself. And so what does this mean? Well, at an intellectual level, which is the level of the oracle, the intellect, right? The neshama. At the, at the intellectual level, I found a quote here that really explains it at that level which is from Viktor Frankl. If you don't know who he is, he was a Holocaust survivor, a psychiatrist. He wrote some great stuff after and how he survived in the prison camps and the concentration camps. Uh, he wrote some great stuff. And he, and he wrote this quote, when we're no longer able to change a situation, we're challenged to change ourselves. So what's interesting here is this is true and, and it's true at this level, but there's a, a deeper truth to this that again, goes back to what I've been saying and, and gets shown through the movies. And that is that everything is still under one domain. It's under everything's under one power. And, and you don't see it if you're looking at this movie like good guys, bad guys, and all that stuff. But there is one ultimate goal for the humans in this, and that is to go back to the way things were only better correctly. And this is ultimately the will and desire of the source, which is the unknowable aspect of the creator. Uh, in Hebrew, it's Ain Sof or the unknowable or the source, all, all, all the same thing. Um, so the, the ultimate goal is, is that, and that means that just like we read in, uh, in the Bible, like in the Purim story where you have the good guy and the bad guy, Mordecai is the good guy and Haman's the bad guy, right? I don't know if you're familiar with that story, but at Purim, it says, oh no, there's no difference between the two. How can that be? You know, bl blessed be Mordecai and cursed be Haman. No, no, they're, they're, they're both the same. How's that? Because ultimately, they're both being sent from the source, the same source for the same purpose. That's that's another lesson behind the scenes here. So if you look at, um, like in the second movie, uh, there's a scene where they come out of the elevator and Morpheus says, oh, everything happened the way it had to happen and could not have happened any other way. What does he mean by that? Again, think back to a node Milvado, only one source. In the third movie, the one where the new Oracle comes in because the actress passed away, um, but she's sitting there with Smith, Agent Smith, the bad guy. And she's just sitting there waiting for him because he's taking over people's bodies. And he's like, why are you here? You know, you, you knew I was coming. Why didn't you run away? And she's just sitting there calmly and tells him, do what you're here to do. Like, there's a plan going on behind the scenes that Smith's not aware of. But again, it's the same thing, you know. And then in the third movie, the character of Sati, a little girl, she comes back as an adult woman. And she knows things that no one else knows again. Same idea. There is a, a master plan behind all of this and everything that happens is simply part of it, even if we don't understand it that way. All right. So I'm going to play this for about 12, 13 minutes and then pause briefly. So I'm going to pause it right before he meets the Oracle, because I want to just mention a couple specific things about the Oracle conversation that are very important. OK, so I'm going to resume the movie for 13 minutes. So don't run too far away here. And screen. Where's my Matrix movie? Here it is. Okay, a little bit of action and then back to the storyline here. We got trouble. Uh -oh. 
Zion send the warning? No, another ship. Shit. Squiddy's sweeping in quick. Squiddy? A sentinel. Killing machine designed for one thing. Search and destroy. Set her down right away. any electrical system in the blast radius. It's the only weapon we have against the machines. Where are we? They're old service and away systems. Sewers? They used to be cities that spend hundreds of miles. Now these sewers are all that's left of them. Quiet. Neil, you scared the bejesus out of me. Sorry. It's okay. Is that... The Matrix? Yeah. Do you always look at it and code it? Well, you have to. The image translators work for the construct program. But there's way too much information to decode the Matrix. You get used to it. I, I don't even see the code. All I see is blonde, brunette, redhead. Hey, you, uh, want a drink? Sure. You know, um, I know what you're thinking. Because right now I'm thinking the same thing. Actually, I, I've been thinking it ever since I got here. <sighs> why, oh, why didn't I take the blue pill? Good shit, huh? Dozer makes it. It's good for two things. Degreasing engines and killing brain cells. Oh. So, uh, can I ask you something? Did he tell you why he did it? Why you're here? Jesus. What a mind job. So you're here to save the world. What do you say to something like that? Little piece of advice. You see an agent, you do what we do. Run. You run your ass off. Sweet dreams. Do we have a deal, Mr. Reagan? You know, I know this steak doesn't exist. I know that when I put it in my mouth, the Matrix is telling my brain that it is juicy and delicious. After nine years, you know what I realize? <sighs> Ignorance is bliss. 
Then we have a deal. I don't want to remember nothing. Nothing. You understand? I... And I want to be rich. You know, someone important. Or like an actor. Whatever you want, Mr. Regan. Okay. You can get my body back in a power plant. Reinsert me into the Matrix. I'll get you what you want. Access codes to the Zion mainframe. No, I told you I don't know them. I can get you the man who does. Morpheus. Here you go, buddy. Breakfast of champions. If you close your eyes, it almost feels like you're eating runny eggs. You know, a bowl of snot. Do you know what it really reminds me of? Tasty wheat. Did you ever eat tasty wheat? No, but technically neither did you. Well, that's exactly my point. Exactly. Because you have to wonder now. How do the machines really know what tasty wheat tasted like, huh? Maybe they got it wrong. Maybe what I think tasty wheat tasted like actually tasted like uh, oatmeal or, uh, or tuna fish. That makes you wonder about a lot of things. Uh, you, you take chicken, for example, maybe they couldn't figure out what to make chicken taste like, which is why chicken tastes like everything. Uh, maybe they couldn't Shut figure up, out. Mouse. It's a single-celled protein combined with synthetic aminos, vitamins, and minerals. Everything the body needs. It doesn't have everything the body needs. Hmm. So I understand that uh, you've run through the agent training program. You know, I, um, I wrote that program. Here it comes. So what did you think of her? Of who? The woman in the red dress. I designed her. She, um, well, she doesn't talk very much, but but if you'd like to meet her, I can arrange a much more personalized bill to give you. The digital pimp hard at work. I pay no attention to these hypocrites, Neo. To deny our own impulses is to deny the very thing that makes us human. Dozer, when you're done, Bring the ship up to broadcast depth. We're going in. Taking Neo to see her. See who? The Oracle. Everyone, please observe. The bass and seatbelt and no smoking signs have been turned on. Sit back and enjoy your food. these memories from my life. None of them happened. What does that mean? That the Matrix cannot tell you who you are. But an Oracle can? That's different. Did you go to her? Yes. What did she tell you? She told me Here, Neo, come with me.
So is this the same oracle that made the, uh, the prophecy? Yes. She's very old. She's been with us since the beginning. The beginning? Of the Resistance. And she knows what? Everything? She would say she knows enough. And she's never wrong. Try not to think of it in terms of right and wrong. She is a guide, Neil. She can help you to find the path. She helped you? Yes. What did she tell you? That I would find the one. I told you I can only show you the door. You have to walk through it. Morpheus, Neo, come with me. These are the other potentials. You can wait it here. not try and bend the spoon. That's impossible. Instead, only try to realize the truth. What truth? There is no spoon. There is no spoon? Then you'll see that it is not the spoon that bends. It is only yourself. The Oracle will see you now. Okay, I had mentioned I was going to pause it here just very quickly because I just got a couple things because he's going to see the Oracle. And as I mentioned earlier, all the conversations that are directly between Neo and one of the major characters are very significant. And in each movie, at the midway point, so, so to speak, uh, he meets with the Oracle. This is always go. It always starts with him being asleep and awakening to some new aspect of his reality, which is the next soul level. And then he has to have some kind of struggle in terms of accepting things like mentally, emotionally, which was very difficult as we saw in the previous scenes, as well as some type of physical struggle sometimes, which he did with Morpheus in terms of training and all that. Having gone through these stages, as Trinity said, when he's ready, he's now at the stage where uh, the third stage in each movie where he meets with the Oracle. So as uh, Morpheus mentioned, she's only a guide. She doesn't say this is exactly the way it is because um, the element of choice and free will always has to, to be there just as it is for us, okay? We get guidance. We get even more guidance when we are on the path really sincerely seeking truth. Uh, that's how it works. Um, so that that's important. Um, You'll see in the scene coming up here where she says something to Neo about don't worry about the vase. And he turns around and he knocks the vase over and breaks it. And then she throws this at him saying, well, would you have uh, broken it if I hadn't said anything? Which is a strange line, but it sets up what she's going to talk about after the fact. So the Oracle is uh, very um, uh, related to the idea of the, con of the condition that we are in, not, not like health wise, but like what our present uh, reality is in our world. So I may, I live here, I have this job, I have this sort of health, I have this family, all of those things is what that aspect of the divine puts in our life. And now it's up to us to choose 
how to react to all the things that come into our life, whether it's good, what we would call good news or bad news, or whether it's Mordecai or Haman, as I mentioned earlier, it's still always uh, the condition comes from above and that, uh, and then our response. So the, anyhow, the, that line about the vase, you'll see as it, it plays out through the movies is interesting in terms of how she gives him guidance and uh, information, but he has to deal with it. And at this level, of course, we're still in the first movie, which is the level of basic awareness. So she actually uses almost what could be called a little bit of um, reverse psychology, if you will. Remember, she's at the level of the intellect. We're at that level, uh, that third level, which is the neshama level of the soul, the level of the intellect. Um, in each movie, somebody... I think it's in every movie, you'll hear someone say that the Oracle tells you exactly what you need to hear. So exactly what your condition is, if you're seeking, you will get exactly what you need to hear. And it might not make sense, but it's still what you need to hear. So it, it's, it's uh, anyhow, um, we're at the level of awareness, which is a very basic level of awareness. If you did the meditation series with Luke and I, we had a lot to do with uh, the, at this level of the five senses, taste, touch, smell, all of that. You're going to see that when he meets the Oracle for this first time. She'll talk about the cookies smell good. She'll look in his eyes. She'll tell him, say, ah, she does all these things involving the senses because he's at this very basic uh, level, which is interesting. Uh, she'll let him know that he has something in him like the spark, but he's not ready yet. He's not ready for the, the next level or the next soul level yet. Um, but she hints at it. She drops another hint there saying, well, maybe next time around. You know, so it's all these little interesting things are in this uh, in this conversation. Then she says something very peculiar about Morpheus, because um, you'll you'll hear the conversation. I don't want to give it all away, but she'll say that Morph without Morpheus, they're lost. It's like why is that? Well, if you think back on the first chart we looked at, at where you, Morpheus is that connection between the matrix world and everything else above, he's at that spot of the Zadik, as I mentioned, which is the Sephira of Yesod. It's called. So without that connection. Um, then we're stuck down here in the matrix. So Morpheus represents that aspect of connectivity. And without that, we are truly lost. We would just be stuck down here in this miserable world, right? Um, okay. So, oh yeah. And when, yeah. And when Neo does get outside, Morpheus uh, tells him something interesting. He tells Neo, says, what was said to you is for you and you alone. So that's an interesting concept in that there is a general path that we all follow. Remember the chart we saw at the very beginning? There's a chart uh, in terms of how creation came about from God above and then how our path back follows the same. So we all follow that path, but yet we still have very individualized um, things that we have to deal with and that we do. And so he says that to Neo, that there's a general path, but there's always a, there's also a specific one for the person. So he tells that Neo that on the way out. Um, and then the, let me just go uh, put up the slideshow real quick. I almost forgot to do that. I'm forgetting my slides here. Hold on a second. I might as well show you this because I did make them. Uh, there's our spoon boy coming. Oh, did I do that right? One second, guys. Sorry. Screen taskbar. Um, share screen. Here we go. again so this will come up in a second here so we did the spoon boy slide and now we're going to the next one so here's our friend the oracle right so the oracle another little chart here for you so the oracle as i mentioned earlier is the represents the aspect of bina which is the mother in kabbalah and she's called the mother in the movie and she's the divine feminine. So in book of Genesis, where it says we're made in the image of God, as I mentioned, this whole story is about returning to that image of God. So the image of God is what? Male and female in Genesis. So you have the masculine architect that you'll meet in the next movie. And she's the feminine counterpart, the father and mother of the matrix. Okay. And at Bina, the, the thing about Bina, what's so in, uh, un, which means understanding at this level, you have, uh, like I said before, she relates to everything uh, below all the, especially the humans, but the program world too, that's all explained in the second movie. And, but she also relates back to where she emanated from, which was uh Hochma or uh, wisdom or the architect before. So she's at that very, you can see very significant visually point between the upper worlds and the, the lower program uh, and uh, matrix worlds below. Okay. Um, let's see. 
and then Temet Nose. So they throw a lot of curveballs in this movie. So you have the Oracle, which is kind of a Greek idea, right? The Oracle at uh, Delphi there. Uh, and then you have this sign on the wall, Temet Nose, which is Latin. So you have Greek, you have Latin. People are all focused on that. It has nothing to do with Greek or Latin. Those are, again, think conceptually. And uh, Temet Nose means know thyself, which, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, to know is to connect. And it's yourself. That's this is the concept of teshuva. Oh, by the way, in Kabbalah, bina is also called teshuva. Um, it's one of the names for it. So this is about connecting to your true self, made in the image of God. Um, so that's uh, that's an important little part coming up. This does not come up in. Yeah, it does. It comes up in this movie. Yeah, it does come up in this movie. Sorry, that's why I have it here. Um, so we'll see that in a moment. And uh, oh wait, hold on, no. We're not going here with Cypher yet. Okay. I don't want to ruin the surprise. All right. So I'm going to stop this share and go back to our movie. And we're going to watch. Uh, I'm going to pause it in about five minutes one more time really briefly because there's something wild that comes up with the Cypher character that I have. To, if you don't know it, it's pretty amazing. All right. Here we go. Share screen. Back to the movie. And my dinner is beeping in the oven. So it's all working out. I know you're Neil. Be right with you. You're the Oracle? Bingo. Not quite what you were expecting, right? Almost done. Smell good, don't they? Yeah. I'd ask you to sit down, but you're not going to anyway. And don't worry about the vase. What vase? That vase. I'm sorry. I said don't worry about it. I'll get one of my kids to fix it. How did you know? Oh, what's really going to bake your noodle later on is, would you still have broken it if I hadn't said anything? You're cuter than I thought. I can see why she likes you. Who? Not too bright, though. You know why Morpheus brought you to see me. So, what do you think? Do you think you are the one? Honestly, I don't know. You know what that means? Latin means know thyself. I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. Being the one is just like being in love. No one can tell you you're in love, you just know it through and through, balls to bones. Well, I better have a look at you. Open your mouth, say ah. Uh. Ah. Uh. Okay. Now I'm supposed to say, hmm, that's interesting, but then you say. But what? But you already know what I'm going to tell. I'm not the one. Sorry, kid. You got the gift. But it looks like you're waiting for something. What? Your next life, maybe. Who knows? That's the way these things go. What's funny? Morpheus. He, uh... He almost had me convinced. I know. Poor Morpheus. Without him, we were lost. What do you mean, without him? Are you sure you want to hear this? 
Morpheus believes in you, Neo. And no one, not you, not even me, can convince him otherwise. He believes it so blindly that he's going to sacrifice his life to save yours. What? You're going to have to make a choice. In the one hand, you'll have Morpheus's life. And in the other hand, you'll have your own. One of you is going to die. Which one will be up to you? I'm sorry, kiddo, I really am. You have a good soul. And I hate giving good people bad news. No. Don't worry about it. As soon as you step outside that door, you'll start feeling better. You'll remember you don't believe in any of this fate crap. You're in control of your own life. Remember? Here. Take a cookie. I promise by the time you're done eating it, you'll feel right as rain. It was said was for you, and for you alone. All right, let's end on that cookie munch right there. Okay, so um, one quick note on something that seems insignificant, but when she says to him, uh, I can see why she likes you, you're cute. OK, so she thinks you're cute. So speaking of Trinity and her attraction to Neo, and they say, well, what's the big deal there? Hold the thought. Remember, I said in the car, she did not. She stopped short of saying something. I'm going to tell you right now, there's three, two more times that she will stop short of saying the same thing. And on the fourth time, she says it. And each of those has something significant to it. And the first one has something to do with why um that line where the oracle says i see why she likes you you're cute you're attractive it's physical attraction okay just hold that thought for now all right so now we're about to see something pretty cool i'm going to show you something that just is just really amazing this is cypher coming up as we've seen cypher is about to uh betray them all if you haven't figured that out that's what's about to happen and um back to our wonderful slideshow so here comes mr cypher our friend Right in the background here. Now, Cypher, I'm going to give you three quotes that are coming up in the scenes ahead that he says. All right. And we're going to compare them to some quotes from the book of Numbers. Remember, there were comparisons here, the people being freed uh, and they're, uh, to the Bible's uh, exile, uh, freedom from the, uh, the exile and freedom from Egypt. Okay. Uh, so that's one of the comparisons you can make. So Cypher says these three things. He says, why didn't I take the blue pill? Meaning, you know, why did he leave that nice matrix world for this, this difficult world that he's in? Then he says, I'm tired of eating the same goddamn goop every day. As we saw that stuff, they were pouring out of the, the, the pipes there that look like runny eggs, right? Okay. Why am I eating that goop every day? Then he turns on against Morpheus, like directly tired of his bull and he lied to us he tricked us if he had told us the truth he would have told him you know da 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 call this free right all i do is what he tells me to do if i had to choose between that and the matrix i'd choose the matrix so he's basically saying i i'd, I'd prefer to go back all right now if you don't already see what's coming look at these side by side comparisons all right the people started complaining why did we come out of egypt why did we take the blue pill our souls are dried away there's nothing but this manna Yuck, who will feed us meat, right? Tired of the same goop every day. Then they turned against Moses. It's a small thing that you, Moses, have brought us out of the land flowing milk and honey, <laughs> Egypt, to kill us in the wilderness. Why do you also have to make yourself prince over us, right? Um, Cypher telling everyone what to do. Moreover, you've not brought us to a land of milk and honey, nor given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Why do you also put out the eyes of these men? So you see this amazing comparison between the character of Cypher here and the um, 
the attitude or and comments made by the uh, the Israelites uh, or some of them uh, as they came out of Egypt. And so they escaped the matrix uh, of Egypt and uh, they were heading toward freedom, right? The Torah, you know, um, the freedom of the Torah. Uh, and uh, they started complaining because it, it's rough. It's, it's, not, it's not a picnic. And that's exactly what's going on here. All right. Um, I think, what's the slide after this? I don't want to get too far ahead here. Um, all right, so we're going to take a look. Yes, yeah, Smith's coming up, but we're going to take a look real quick at the cipher scene here. And I'll put the movie back on. I just wanted you to see that part because it's pretty cool. Oh, you got some action scenes coming up here. So we are going where we, we are at. Uh, I think we're going for about five and 17.50. We're going for about 13 minutes here. Okay, then we'll have a little break. What did you just say? Nothing, just a little deja vu. What did you see? What happened? A black cat went past us, and then another that looked just like it. How much like it? Was it the same cat? Might have been, I'm not sure. Switch, hey, Puck. What is it? A deja vu is usually a glitch in the Matrix. It happens when they change something. changed we're trapped there's no way out be calm give me your phone they'll be able to track it we have no choice operator tank find a structural drawing of this building find it fast you got it i need the main wet wall eighth floor Switch straight ahead. Neil. I hope the Oracle gave you some good news. Now left, that's it. Good.
Take him. Sykes at Franklin and Area, no TV repair shop. Right. Operator. Tank, it's me. Is Morpheus alive? Is Morpheus alive, Tank? Yes. They're moving him. I don't know where to yet. He's alive. We need an exit. You're not far from Cypher. Cypher? I know. He's in the Franklin area. Got it. Trinity. Cypher, where's Tank? You know, for a long time, I thought I was in love with you. I used to dream about you. You're a beautiful woman, Trinity. The bad things have to turn out this way. You killed them. What? Oh, God. I'm tired, Trinity. I'm tired of this war. I'm tired of fighting. I'm tired of this ship. Being cold, of eating the same goddamn goop every day. But most of all... I'm tired of that jack off and all of his bullshit. Surprise! 
wise asshole. I bet you never saw this coming. Did you? God, I wish I could be there. When they break you. I wish I could walk in just when it happens. So right then, you know it was me. You gave them Morpheus. He lied to us, Trinity. He tricked us. If you would have told us the truth, we would have told you to shove that red pill right up your ass. That is not true, Cypher. He set us free. Free? You call this free? All I do is what he tells me to do. If I got to choose between that and the Matrix, I choose the Matrix. The Matrix isn't real. I disagree, Trinity. I think the Matrix can be more real than this world. All I do is pull a plug here. But there, you have to watch Apoc die. Trinity. No! Welcome to the real world, huh, baby? But you're out, Cypher. You can't go back. Oh, no. That's what you think. You're gonna reinsert my body. I go back to sleep, and when I wake up, I won't remember a goddamn thing. By the way, if you have anything terribly important to say to Switch, I suggest you say it now. Oh, no. Please don't. Not like this. Not like this. Too late. God damn you, Cypher! Don't hate me, Trinity. I'm just a messenger. And right now, I'm gonna prove it to you. Morpheus was right. And there's no way I can pull this plug. I mean, if Neo's the one, then there'd have to be some kind of a miracle to stop me. Right? I mean, how can he be the one if he's dead? You never did answer me before. If you bought into Morpheus' bullshit. Come on. All I want is a little yes or no. Look into his eyes. Those big, pretty eyes. And tell me. Yes or no? Yes. No! I don't believe it. Believe it or not, you piece of shit, you're still gonna burn. Okay, he's back here. Um, I missed one slide before, so I'm going to show you, but um, <clears throat> let me pull that up real quick. And we're getting into the last half hour of the movie here, so hang in there, folks. Thank you for hanging in there. There's more to come. Uh, let's see, share screen, go back to the PowerPoint. Uh, I didn't do the Smith slide, but I, I probably should have, I think, yeah. So Agent Smith, our friend here, as I mentioned, he's associated with the aspect of Geborah, which is restriction, judgment, all that kind of stuff, uh, a very accusatory. This is an aspect of that as well as we're going to uh, we're going to see all of those things are part of of who he is at that level. Um, the destructive force as well as you'll hear one scene. I don't think no, we didn't get to it yet. He'll actually use the word destroy them. So there's a lot of aspects that are all intertwined there within uh, that. Uh, Gevora aspect of the the other side, the opposing side. Um, interesting too. Uh, the Oracle is called the Mother of the Matrix and everything, but there's a direct relationship between Bina, as you see on the screen. Bina and Gevora descends from Bina because Bina is the side of understanding with the details, and so the judgment stems from that. And it's in the third movie where he actually directly calls the Oracle mom, his mother. It's like, people, why did he call him her mom? It's like, this is why. We'll, we'll get to that in the third movie. 
Um, okay. So coming up here, this, oh, yeah, I want to show you this. This comes up in the second movie, but I wanted to show you something. This is a scene from the second movie. I'm just throwing it in now because it ties to Smith. This is a car he drives up in. And a close-up of the license plate here is kind of interesting. IS5416. If you haven't seen this before, this is really interesting. So this is Smith's car in the next movie, IS5416. And you're like, well, what's, 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 excuse me. Yeah. What's the deal with that? Okay. Uh, well, we'll get to that in a second, actually. <laughs> Spoiler alert. That uh, We'll come back to that in a minute. Or is that on the next slide? Uh, I'm not sure if it is or not. Let me see here. Okay. Well, let's just do these slides then. So, um, as I said, he's uh, he plays the role of the accuser, which is Hasetan, right? But he's also the destroyer, which is related to that as well. And you'll hear his, uh, his accusatory uh, accusations against... Uh, human beings uh, coming up here, which is very interesting because it's, it's again, Smith is not a liar. He actually speaks the truth from his uh, perspective, which is very fascinating. Okay, so we're going to see that coming up here. Remember the license plate IS5416 that I was just mentioning? Um, and I had mentioned earlier that there's two aspects of, uh, of the other side fear and desire fear is agent smith and what he does to keep people in the matrix and then we'll see in the second movie we'll get to the the more serpent aspect which is desire and temptation hedonistic lifestyle of pleasure and all that which is the merovingian but remember the license plate is5416 so here's your verse from isaiah 5416 is5416 which they put on the license plate behold i've created this is a king james i think behold i've created the smith that blows coals in the fire and brings forth his work. And I have a typo. <laughs> I have an instrument for, oh, bad typo. Created, oh, the C belongs in front of, something happened here. I got to fix that later. I've created the uh, in instrument, the waster to destroy. So that's actually, they put the verse from Isaiah, sorry about the typo, on the license plate, which is pretty amazing. And as I mentioned, the Merovingian is more of the serpent figure. Oops, sorry. And going back to... Uh, going back to the Garden of Eden story and being expelled from Eden, which is kind of almost the backstory to the Matrix of having a nice setup and, and being uh, self-centered to the point that you you mess up bad and get kicked out into the Matrix world, our world, and now we have to deal with that and find our way back, okay? So these are your two aspects that will come up through the movie in the form of these two people here. As I mentioned, Smith is uh, honest throughout. He says something interesting in this movie that this is not the first version of the Matrix. We find out in the next movie that this is the sixth, number sixth one, which is very significant Kabbalistically. We'll get to that in two weeks from now. And um, he mentions too that um, he has to get free uh, to, to do what he needs to do from his perspective. But that's also true that for what he really needs to do, which he doesn't realize is end the matrix. That's that's the part he doesn't see. He does need to be freed. And in the second movie, he, he actually tells Neo, thanks for freeing me. Uh, again, from his perspective, it's one thing. From the ultimate perspective, it's another. So that's going to be coming up next uh, next time around. Um, let's see here. Um, did a break here. All right, yeah, we're in the last section. So I'm going to take you through a few more slides and then that'll be it for slides. So let's just look at them all here and then play the movie to the end. <laughs> Trinity, now here's interesting. So Trinity being the modeled on the divine feminine, right? This also goes back to Genesis and the Genesis account is a singular being, right? And, and that's where this whole story is going back to the sing singularity. And that singular being in Genesis one is then split into two beings, a male and a female. And the female in the um, Hebrew is called, she's called Ezer Kenegdo to Adam which is in a uh, King James has helpmate. What does that mean? Or help me it's in Hebrew. It means it's an opposing force, but one for your benefit. So you'll see here, especially in the next scene coming up that Trinity takes uh, for the first time, she confronts Neo. She actually takes on as an opposed as Ezra Kenegdo to Neo with regard to going back to saving Morpheus. She tells him off. And it's interesting because it's also in the scene coming up will be the second. Remember I told you to remember something about Trinity this next uh, instance of her um, not saying something. She goes to say something and then stops short. You'll see it happen again. 
And then after seeing, after they rescue Morpheus, it happens a third time where she says, the Oracle told me something and I don't know how to tell you. And again, it got short, okay? And so the second one has to do with this communication they're going to have where she challenges him. So remember the aspect of, of communicating. And the third one, there's a silence. She stops and there's like 20 seconds where they just next to each other with no word spoken. They're just breathing. So remember the first one was physical. She thought he was cute. The second one is that um, she uh, is speaking to him, uh, opposing him through speech. And then the third one will be that silence where they're just breathing next to each other. So just remember those three things as we go forward. Um, okay, so this is coming up here too, which is interesting, Ezra Conegdo, another, another concept. <laughs> And then, <clears throat> excuse me, then the first time they actually come together to do something, they're very unified. This is the first time they hold each other, the male and the female, the husband, wife, masculine, feminine, however you want to call it, bride and groom coming together, which is a huge concept in, in Kabbalah that the, 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 the world and the spiritual realms coming together symbolized by the, the Shekinah and, and her husband or the, or the groom and the bride, okay? And this is in prayer books and everything, okay? The unification of these two. And it's symbolized by... Uh, Neo being the sixth version of the one, because this is the sixth matrix, those six sephirot, the six emanations that I don't know if you remember the diagram that together they're masculine and the one at the bottom, Malkut, is feminine. So the concept of six is the masculine, the concept of the seventh is feminine, which is why the bride circles the groom um, uh, seven times. She's the seven goes around the groom seven times in a, in a Jewish wedding. And the number 42 is significant to this, okay? So when they're in the elevator, they stop at floor number 41, but they get on top and hug together on top of the elevator car at the 42nd level, which is just kind of really weird, but amazing. Uh, you know, I know this because when you, if you folks, when he presses the elevator button or actually it says it on the, uh, on the readout, you'll see 41, but then they climb above. I'm like, son of a gun. They're on the 42nd level and they hug together to complete this phase of the mission, which I thought was absolutely fascinating that these little details that are in there. So Neo's trying to take out Smith. There's a big gunfight coming up. And this is a real interesting quote. This is a quote actually from Chabad, from Rabbi the late Rabbi Schneerson, talking about how to deal with these elements of darkness. So in, in Neo's mind, it's like, oh, I got to kill Smith and eradicate him. But you can't. And remember, you can't kill an idea. You get That's out of beef and vendetta, by the way. You can't kill a concept or an idea, okay, which is what Smith represents uh, in a force, okay? So when light pushes away darkness, eventually another darkness shall come. That is literally what happens in the next movie when Smith comes back. But then by the third movie, Neo understands something that Smith doesn't understand. And he actually transforms Smith into an agent of uh, of light in the third movie, which is bizarrely amazing. So, so this important concept here, uh, it also applies to us ourselves internally with what's called our Yetzir Hara, our own inclination to do selfish or evil things. You can't crush it and make it go away. You have to learn how to manage it, how to deal with it and turn it into a, 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 a conduit for good, for the light from above, the true godly light. So interesting uh, thing to keep in mind. It's not really a big issue in this movie, except that Neo's still thinking in terms of destroying Smith and then he, and then he comes back. A um, couple more slides here. Let's see. I'm <clears throat> going quickly because I know it's getting late. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, Trinity um, thought Neo was cute, physical attraction. Then she spoke up to him, right? The voice and the speech going back and forth. And then she uh, um, stops or what she was going to say for a third time, which, by the way, is that she was told she would fall in love with the one. She couldn't say that till the right moment. And then here we come. The end of the movie is a movie that one of the scenes that many viewers thought was so disappointing was that, oh, it looks like they're doomed. And then she gives him this magic kiss and, and everything works out. But no, this is very deep, actually, because the kiss can only come at this level after going through the first three. Here's a quote from Arya Kaplan talking about the spiritual dimension of a of the kiss. There are four levels in the intimacy of love, physical attraction, speech, breath, and the kiss. These are exactly the four aspects or the four things that happen with Trinity, as I just mentioned. Physical attraction, he's cute, speech, as the Ezra Konegdo scene you're going to see where she stands up to him. Then the next scene where they don't talk, they're just 20 seconds breathing next to each other. And finally, at the end, the kiss. And this kiss is highly significant. It's in the very first or second verse of Shir Hashirim, which I mentioned earlier, Song of Songs is the, the male and the female 
concept coming together, which is foundational to the Matrix movies. And we're going to be going into that this summer, the text. So it's kind of neat how this uh, concept of the kiss is going to uh, bring us into that study over the summer. If you want to participate in that, more info is coming. So this is toward the end of the movie here. Um, let's see here. I think is that oh, there's probably one more slide or two. Let's see. Oh, yeah. So this is interesting, of course, at the end when Neo actually she kisses Trinity and the life force from above now that everything has been brought together. So he's at this he's gotten to this fourth level of, of knowing it's more than just him and he's willing to give up his life. And this fourth level of Chaya is called life or life force. And it's also the force of resurrection. Bingo. He comes back to life, right? And he's able to manipulate these bullets because now he's at this level where he is willing to give up his life for others. And here's a quote from Rabbi Yitzhak Ginsburg, a very prominent uh, rabbi today. The righteous one, which is the Zadik, in touch with the inner pure form of all reality is able to shape reality in accordance with his will. As is said, the righteous one decrees and God realizes this is really profound. Remember, Morpheus said you won't have to dodge bullets, but Neo literally will see the bullets coming at him and simply speak to them and say, no, no. He just says no, and the bullets just slow down, and he's able to pick them out of the air. This is a fascinating depiction of this concept, particularly at this level of the first movie after the kiss and, and all of these levels that he's progressed through. So he's actually at the fifth level of Yehida, which is... Um, uh, being willing to lay down your life for others, martyrdom, which is another Hasidic Chabad teaching. And um, and then that's the doorway to the next level and the next soul level, the next movie. Okay, so at the end of each movie, he somehow dies and then he wakes up in the next movie. Same thing in the next movie. He dies at the end, wakes up in the next movie. It's, it's interesting. It's always just a progression of one soul level to the other. And I think that takes us to the last slide, yes. At the very end, he's on the phone, and this is wild too. He gives this little speech about what he's ultimate, the ultimate uh, end to it all, why he's here, what he's looking to bring at the very end, which is of course the new reality, you know, that will take place. And he gives his speech here at the top. All right, I'll let you read it real quick. He's talking to the like the program machine worlds or the force, the other side, right? He's like, uh, and look closely at some of these details here, a world without rules, no controls, no borders, no boundaries, anything's possible, right? So where is this from? This is, this is nuts. This is from here. Every valley be exalted, mountains and hills brought low, no borders or boundaries, crooked places made straight. And then at the end, everything comes together. Uh, everything will be possible. So this is a paraphrase of Isaiah at the very end. And this of course is not realized in this movie. As I mentioned much earlier, there's more than one stage to the redemption. This is just the first stage. We'll address what that means in future movie nights, okay? So that's that's it. I'm done talking fast. I'm going to stick around after for all the questions you want. Oh, there we go. Uh, July 6th will be the next one. Here we go. Um, Matrix Reloaded. So let's go back to our movie. Uh, as I said, if you missed any of this, it is recorded, and I will stick around uh, for questions and in the group, too, uh, the Matrix group that we have on Facebook. You can post questions in there, too. All right, so I'm going to stop this share and go take us back to the final 30 minutes here. There's a lot that happens, but I hope some of that explanation will bring some clarification. Share screen, back to the movie. You know that the first Matrix was designed to be a perfect human world where none suffered, where everyone would be happy. And it was a disaster. No one would accept the program. Entire crops were lost. Some believed that we lacked the programming language to describe your perfect world, but I believe that as a species, human beings define their reality through 
misery and suffering. The perfect world is a dream that your primitive cerebrum kept trying to wake up from. Which is why the Matrix was redesigned to this, the peak of your civilization. And I say your civilization because as soon as we started thinking for you, it really became our civilization, which is, of course, what this is all about. Evolution, Morpheus. Evolution. Like the dinosaur. Look out that window. You've had your time. The future is our world, Morpheus. The future is our time. There could be a problem. What are they doing to him? They're breaking into his mind. It's like hacking a computer. All it takes is time. How much time? Depends on the mind. But eventually it'll crack. And his alpha patterns will change from this to this. And it does Morpheus each other anything they want to know. But what do they want? The leader of every ship is given codes to Zion's mainframe computer. If an agent got the codes and got into Zion's mainframe, they could destroy us. Can't let that happen. Trinity, Zion's more important than me, or you, or even Morpheus. Well, there has to be something that we can do. There is. We pull the plug. You're gonna kill him. Kill Morpheus. We don't have any other choice. Never send a human to do a machine's job. If indeed the insider has failed, they'll sever the connection as soon as possible. Unless... They're dead. In either case, we have no choice but to continue as planned. Deploy the Sentinels immediately. Morpheus, you're more than a leader to us. You're a father. We'll miss you always. Stop. Neil, this has to be done. Doesn't? I don't know. I... This can't be just coincidence. It can't be. What are you talking about? The Oracle. She told me this would happen. She told me... that I would have to make a choice. What choice? What are you doing? I'm going in. No, you're not. I have to. Neil, Morpheus sacrificed himself so that we could get you out. There is no way that you're going back in. Morpheus did what he did because he believed that I'm something I'm not. What? I'm not the one, Trinity. The Oracle hit me with that, too. No, you have to be. I'm sorry, I'm not. I'm just another guy. No, Neo, that's not true. It can't be true. Why? Neo, this is Loco. They've got Morpheus in a military-controlled building, even if you somehow got inside. Those are agents holding him. Three of them. I want Morpheus back, too, but what you're talking about is suicide. I know that's what it looks like, but it's not. I can't explain to you why it's not. Morpheus believed something, and he was ready to give his life for what he believed. I understand that now. That's why I have to go. Why? Because I believe in something. What? I believe I can bring him back. What are you doing? I'm going with you. No, you're not. No? Let me tell you what I believe. I believe Morpheus means more to me than he does to you. I believe if you are really serious about saving him, you are going to need my help. And since I am the ranking officer on this ship, if you don't like it, I believe you can go to hell. Because you aren't going anywhere else. Tank, load us up.
like to share a revelation that I've had during my time here. It came to me when I tried to classify your species. I realized that you're not actually mammals. Every mammal on this planet instinctively develops a natural equilibrium with the surrounding environment, but you humans do not. You move to an area and you multiply and multiply until every natural resource is consumed. And the only way you can survive is to spread to another area. There is another organism on this planet that follows the same pattern. Do you know what it is? A virus. Human beings are a disease, a cancer of this planet. You are a plague, and we are the cure. Okay, so what do you need? Besides a miracle. Guns. Lots of guns. Neo. No one has ever done anything like this. That's why it's going to work. Why isn't the serum working? Perhaps we're asking the wrong questions. Leave me with him. Now. Hold on, Morpheus. They're coming for you. They're coming. Can you hear me, Morpheus? I'm going to be honest. Zion is destroyed. There is no need for me to be here. Do you understand? I need the codes. I have to get inside Zion. And you have to tell me how. You're going to tell me, or you're going to die.
What were you doing? He doesn't know. them and destroy them. Dodge this. How did you do that? Do what? You move like they do. I've never seen anyone move that fast. It wasn't fast enough. Can you fly that thing? Not yet. Operator. Tank, I need a pilot program for a B-212 helicopter. Hurry. Let's go.
the one. Do you believe it now, Trinity? Morpheus. The Oracle. She told me She I... told you exactly what you needed to hear. That's all. Neo, sooner or later you're going to realize, just as I did, there's a difference between knowing the path and walking the path. Operator? Tank. God damn, it's good to hear your voice, sir. You need an exit. Got one ready. Subway station. State in Balbo. Damn it. The trace was completed. We have their position. Sentinels are standing by. Order the strike. something but I'm afraid of what it could mean if I do everything the Oracle told me has come true everything but this An agent, you have to send me back. I can't. Mr. Anderson. Enjoy watching you die, Mr. Anderson. Thank you. 
Mr. Anderson, that is the sound of inevitability. It is the sound of your death. Goodbye, Mr. Anderson. My name is Neil. What happened? Oh no, I lost him. Oh shit. Sentinels. How long? Five, maybe six minutes. Tank, charge the EMP. We can't use that until he's out. I know, Trinity, don't worry. He's gonna make it. Find four pumps. No, just... What the shit? At my phone! I got the back phone! Got him. He's in the run. Mr. Wizard! Get me the hell out of here! Got a patch on an old exit. Wabash and Lake. Oh, shit. at the end of the alley, room 303. side.
chicken. He's gone. Goodbye, Mr. Anderson. is the one. I know you're out there. I can feel you now. I know that you're afraid. You're afraid of us. You're afraid of change. I don't know the future. I didn't come here to tell you how this is going to end. I came here to tell you how it's going to begin. I'm going to hang up this phone, and then I'm going to show these people what you don't want them to see. I'm going to show them a world without you. A world without rules and controls, without borders or boundaries. 
A world where anything is possible. Where we go from there is a choice I leave to you. <laughs>